that's a... <laughs> He's correct. Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, this is a nerd show, isn't the, it? Reel to reels have been activated. <laughs> uh, we are recording. <laughs> that's uh, happening. Okay. I'm getting the high sign. That we're at. Uh, Very odd. Yes, it's Nerdist Podcast. This is the most official intro we've ever actually had for the, for the program. Yeah. Uh, we're in New York. Uh, we are recording uh, just off Central Park West. Neil deGrasse Tyson is in the Yay. studio. And Neil, I, Dr. Tyson, Neil. Uh, well, thank you for that one person sitting ovation. That's far. <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough room in this closet we're recording to stand up for an ovation. It is a, it is a uh, spiritual ovation. Well, I feel it. I feel the love. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm very excited to have you on. And Matt I'm also. More excited, probably. Matt is so excited to have you on. Matt actually. I literally flew out. Just for this. Flew out, got in this morning. He's he flying back this afternoon. Sound just for excited. You. He's, he's, oh, hang on. Okay, <laughs> it's happening. You're gonna get. Uh, you're, you're, you're gonna building get, up. Inside. You're gonna get hot jets and nerd. Uh, no, when we first, across. when Chris and I sat down, and we're talking about the podcast. We're like, who do you want to have on? And I was like, Neil deGrasse Tyson. At some point, and that was like 140 episodes ago. Oh, okay. And we finally, we finally worked it out. Yep. Good job. That means this moment is at some point. It is indeed. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> indeed. This also means that because this is being met in Matt's life, it's very downhill from him after his. <laughs> yeah, no. So this is... All downhill from here. Got nothing. This is what we would refer to as a zenith of moments. I'm dying tomorrow. <laughs> so does but it, you can do it happily. My appearance on your show, does that mean I can totally nerd out on the show? Absolutely. Um, yes, yes. If you if you are able to stretch your stretch your nerd wings as much as possible, I assume you will be able to out-nerd us. Um, I, I don't know. You are of uh, superior <laughs> intellect, uh, and I'm I'm a little intimidated, but... It's not intellect, it's nerditude that's matter, that matters <laughs> nerd, here. Nerditude. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so you know, I, I know you've been. Uh, I know you were uh, interested in astrophysics uh, going back to a, a young teenage, a teenage boy. But a lot of no, I was nine. Okay, Just get it straight. Pre Skyview Apartments. <laughs> Thank on. you. Somebody did his homework. I grew up in the Skyview Apartments the, in the, the Bronx. All right. Well, you just glossed over that. I would have been creeped out if someone knew where I lived when I was nine years old. <laughs> but if he hadn't put it in a book, then he could have been creeped out. <laughs> <laughs> but you remember, he didn't you, want anyone to. I suck it up like a sponge. But every kid when they're nine or ten says, "Oh, I want to be an astronaut. I love the stars. I, I you know, we that. we look to the stars." And then so, what what was it about you? What what was it about it specifically for you? Where you said, nah, I'm sticking with it. Like, how did you not reject that in your teen years? I was, I was, I'm old enough so that back then it was the Apollo era. So anyone who mentioned science, it was assumed the Apollo astronauts were, were what was influencing you. But I knew that, that NASA mostly was just going into the low Earth orbit, a couple mm -hmm. hundred miles above Earth. And then when they go far, they go to the moon. But I knew enough about the cosmos to know that the moon isn't going in. <laughs> the moon is <laughs> the nearest possible cosmic object. Right. And I was interested in black holes and galaxies and the Big Bang and the fate of the cosmos. And so uh, my interest was not space exploration driven. It was... And it was a journey of the mind, mm -hmm. not of hardware. In other words, in, I mean, the idea of the the, inf the universe as, as an expanding model or, or just as a static model? No, or? no. The data has always shown that we're expanding on a one-way trip forever. Just get over that fact, okay. first of all. We're not coming back. It's a one-way trip. But I knew that. And just the large-scale universe is what, what, what titillated me, not astronauts in orbit around the Earth. It's okay. Pure. So it was... The pure science of understanding how the universe works, not whether I can be strapped to a capsule and sent somewhere between here and the moon. How do we how how do you conceptualize the universe? Like, how do you because, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of reference on Earth, I think, that really can explain like what direction it's expanding. How like is it even yeah, is it three, four dimensions, five? Like, you're how, asking an important, even philosophical, almost metaphysical question. Let me re reword it in a, please, a slightly please, different please, way. Please. If I want to tell you how big the universe is, if I want to tell you how big anything is, I'll say, oh, that apple is the size of a softball, mm -hmm. or that house is the size of something else. There's always some other thing that you're familiar with that I'm analogizing to. Sure. Now you're going to ask me how big is the universe? And I say, oh, it's as big as, and I've got nothing to refer to. Mm -hmm. So there comes a time and a point where in discussing cosmic subjects, the thing itself has to be your referent. And therein is the challenge of most people to grasp these concepts. Sure. No, I understand. I, I, year, years ago, I read this book called The God Particle by Leon Letterman, which was uh, you know, all about the search for the Higgs boson mm -hmm. in the early 1990s. And you I, have Higgs boson literate listeners? 
<laughs> we cool. do actually. Well, well, I gotta, I gotta do a Higgs boson. We'll do, we'll, we'll talk. Oh, we'll I'm go te- there. I'm telling you, people who come to our live shows, or you know, they say, uh, you know, there's a lot of graphic artists. There's also a lot of engineers. There's a lot of, there's a lot of med students. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of young scientists who listen to the podcast. Cool, cool. Uh, because we make, we talk about science, but then make boner jokes too. So it's like we cover both. <laughs> we try to bridge science and humanity with boners and farts. So hopefully that's that's the sweet spot of where we're at. It's just mostly boner. <laughs> Our show is mostly mostly both. Both. But what but, you're saying is that the topic uh, stimulates your anatomy well, in curious it, ways. Exactly. Uh, and maybe <laughs> that, that's there, another way to consider these two factors. And maybe therein lies the God particle. But, uh, <laughs> but ultimately, I, uh, I, you know, but when I'm reading this book about quarks and subatomic particles, and I have nothing to, re- you know, like the concept of it is, I ke- like you said, I kept having to stop because, like, well, I don't know what to compare that to. Here, here's, a, here's an interesting fact the electron is smaller than our smallest capacity to measure anything. So as far as our data are concerned, the electron is simply a mathematical point in space. Right. We have no idea how small an electron actually is, and it may have zero volume for all we know. Wow. So that's another limit of from large down to something that's so small, we can't tell you how small it is. I'm, I'm also curious about um, uh, 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 t- our, our three-dimensional world, and then, but then the idea of the Minkowski space, and then adding that layer of time. I love higher dimensions, because that just messes with your head. I just, <laughs> it does. I just so love it. Can I give you a quick nerdy please, thing? Please, please, please. No, just to just mess with you. It's sure. Just something that, so you don't go to sleep on time tonight. So <laughs> if you look at a, a line segment, mm-hmm. right, it's bounded by two points. That's what the ends of a line. Sure. So a line segment is one dimension. Mm-hmm. The two points are zero dimensions. Yes. Right? Look at a square. A square is two dimensions bounded by one dimensions. Okay. Okay. Each side is a one dimensional right. line segment. Okay. Okay. You got that? So in other words, we had a one dimensional line bounded by two zero dimensional points. Gotcha. We have a two dimensional s- square yes. bounded by four one dimensional lines. Okay. Now we have a cube. A three-dimensional cube yep. bounded by six two-dimensional sides. Okay. You with me so far? We're throwing some z-axis in that Okay. We got it. So now let's go to four dimensions. Okay. A four-dimensional cube. Guys, I can't go to four dimensions. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Man, go my to four dimensions. My mom said I can't go to <laughs> your, four your dimensions. Your engines can take it. <laughs> it's okay, man. It's cool. All the cool kids are going to four dimensions, okay. Matt. So let me know when to pull up. So just remember these boundaries. The, the line had... Uh, Two boundaries, each zero dimension. Yes. The square has four boundaries, each two, di- each one dimension. Yes. The cube has six boundaries, each two dimension. Got it. The four dimensional cube has eight boundaries, and each boundary is itself a three dimensional cube. Oh my god! Oh, 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 <laughs> that oh, is so oh, cool. Oh, a we're, side. We're not even smoking weed. <laughs> a side of this physical object yes. is a three-dimensional cube. That's, that's one of the boundaries of it. That, uh, that's, that's difficult to wrap the brain around. Well, that's, that's My so, nose just started bleeding. <laughs> so, so, so higher dimensionality takes you, takes you to new places, and you realize how much of a prisoner we are of the three dimensions in which our sight and senses have, uh, have evolved. We are feeble data takers on the, what's really going on in the universe, and I, and I lament this daily. That's why I celebrate all the methods and tools that science has brought to bear to decode the universe. They, they, suppla- they completely supplant our five senses, which themselves just leave them at the door and embrace all the machines because they're the ones that knows really what's going on. If we lived in a two-dimensional world, would we know that? That's what the four-dimensional people are asking of us right now. Do they know they're only in three dimensions? Those smarmy 4D pricks. Those 4D, they're so... How dare they? They're so snooty about their privileged place. They think they know everything with their three-dimensional boundaries. They look at prisoners in a prison cell and say, just step out into a fourth dimension and you escape. What the hell is wrong with you? I bet 3D TV gives them a headache, too. (laughs) Yes, that pile of shit that is 3D TV gives them. So you draw a, a, a pen around an ant, let's say. You embed an ant in a sheet of paper and draw a square around it. That's I'm a prison. It now. That's a prison to an ant. Okay. Because an true. ant can't just jump out of the page. It's embedded in the page. Right. So a square is a prison to an ant. Yes. A, a, a cube 
on all, you know, walls on all sides is a prison to a human, mm-hmm. but not to a four-dimensional creature because they would just step out. If you wanted to imprison a four-dimensional creature, you'd have to bound them on in four dimensions, not only three. Is time that fourth dimension? For us, it's a fourth dimension. But you can imagine another spatial dimension, as I was describing my sure. ascent of the cubes. Going, going in and out in a, a way. That's a great sci-fi <laughs> I'm, I'm the title. Enjoying it. I'm enjoying the it. The ascent, ascent of, of the, the cubes. The ascent of the cubes. <laughs> <laughs> I, it doesn't, you know what? It doesn't even matter what it is. The, just, you just you have the title. You have some sort of an airbrushed uh, sexy kind of, alien on that's the cover. Kind of what happened in Star Trek with the Borg? The ascent of they the just cube. had a Borg cube. Is that is that all yeah, it was? The cube came, and then it could have been it. called the ascent of the cubes. That's what I'm saying. Well, why didn't they? I don't know. All right, they weren't thinking outside of the cube. We'll get we'll get Lindelof on that. We'll get <laughs> Lindelof on that. Who's writing the Star Trek movies? Um, when I was a, when I was a kid, I, this always stuck with me. There was a there was a, an advertisement for Discover magazine, and uh, and then I, it was this guy, and and he had this very dramatic voice, and he said, uh, "Imagine you could travel in a spaceship close to the speed of light." I'm, I'm listening. You know what I mean? Yeah. He goes. Uh, so when you leave, um, I I get on that spaceship. I, I go away for an hour. I come back to Earth. I'm an hour older, but I'll find that a baby is now an old man. Is that is that sort of is that is that is that Einstein uh, relativity? Yeah, yeah. Right. pure yeah. pure special relativity. You get that in relativity one on one. I'm an idiot, and so I don't. Could you please explain that to me? <laughs> I remember in seventh grade there was someone who did a project on Einstein, and we're trying to explain it, and and they didn't quite grasp it, and I had to go. I raised my hand, went up to the chalkboard, and drew it out for them. Like what Einstein's theory? Of What'd you draw? I drew a timeline along with a spaceship and showing that the faster this person accelerated, they were moving, they were going at a certain speed, experiencing time a certain way. While on Earth, everyone was just experiencing time the same way. But what did you get going. in this class? Uh, this was social studies class. <laughs> social oh, it's so f. So <laughs> they were just really didn't want that. Part oh, okay. of it. Let's go but to anyway. the judges, uh, Dr. Tyson. But it, uh, it is a, it is a, uh, it's it's real. We know it will happen. And some people say, "How do you know? Have you done it before?" Mm-hmm. People always ask. Have you, well, we have. Yeah. Not with humans, but there are particles which, when left undisturbed, will decay into another species of particle in a certain amount of time. Take that same particle, accelerate it. In any one of our chosen particle accelerators sure. to 99% the speed of light, its internal clock shifts and ticks more slowly as you observe it than your clock does. The particle, So you can prolong how long it takes the particle to decay. That's what's interesting about it. But how do we it's measure things? Internal clock. How do we measure things outside of our perception? Well, they've done, you can perceive it, though. They've tested it. With like it's not clock. about perception. Is it, are, are you still the particle we started here, or have you turned into another particle? No, man, I've grown. I've moved on. Well, there it is. These particles move on, they decay, and the time it takes them to decay lengthens when we speed them up. That, and in, exact, in the exact way that Einstein relativity prescribes. So it's not just some weird thing happens, we don't understand it, so we wave our hands. We've got this calculated with extremely high precision, and it happens every time. And we're, no, we're given no reason to think that if I accelerated your butt that fast, that somehow you would behave any differently from a subatomic particle. Because ultimately, we, they are the building blocks of all the things that we know. Beautifully put. <laughs> Good job, Chris. If you're comprised of the particles that they themselves are influenced by this time dilation, so too will you. But why is there no unified field theory then? Well, so that's a, that's an interesting question. It's we assume there's one to be found, don't we? I guess we do. That's kind of audacious, isn't it? Well, because we, we pl- like simplicity. We we are layering onto the universe our own philosophical requirements for it to behave as we wish. Sure. The universe historically has not really. Uh, obeyed us in that way. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, Kepler was sure. Uh, Kepler, the mathematician, early 1600s, a contemporary of Galileo, by the way, sure. both of whom were contemporaries of Queen Elizabeth the first. Just to put all this in time context, who was and Shakespeare, they were all running around at the same time. So when you look at what the uh, what he tried to do, he tried to figure out the orbits of the planets, and he said, you know, there are five. Platonic solids. You mm-hmm. know these five solids. One is a. These are these are solid shapes where each side is the same polygon. Yes. So you have a tetrahedron. That's a pyramid. You have a cube. We all we all know cubes. Then there's an icosahedron, an octahedron, and a dodecahedron. Mm-hmm. There's only five. 
He was so enchanted by this, and he knew that there were six planets. He said, well, the planets are in the cosmos, and that's, that's, that's the, the majestic universe. It must, it must obey this beautiful math, because math is perfect. So surely, these, this can't be an accident that there's six planets and five platonic solids. Well, I'm thinking, now how's he going to pull out of this one, right? <laughs> so, because those numbers don't match. So he said, these five platonic solids must represent the separations among the six planets. Because they're five separations. Oh. Yeah, you see? So he spent 10 years trying to work this, sure that it was the right way, because that's how the universe must be. That's the elegant way to do the universe. He didn't know that we would later discover more planets. He didn't know that he was just barking up the wrong tree. He didn't know that planet orbits, in fact, were not perfect circles, that they're ellipses. Sure. He would later figure that out. But the point is that the history of science is replete with people trying to layer their own philosophical elegance. And that onto. was 10 years, 1600s. They didn't even have to shower, so they had like way more time. <laughs> yeah, they didn't. They, they, that, that's right. They only showered if they needed to yeah. in their life. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, it, al- it also is interesting, the idea of, uh, and I mean, I don't want to I don't want to get too much into this, but it always it is something that irritates me, is just this sort of, like this hardcore creationist idea of irreducible complexity where they, you know, where they say, like, well, nothing can be more. I mean, like, you can't, that's as simple as that thing can be. And, like, yeah, if you looked at a frog a thousand years ago, you would have said that's as simple as that can be. Then you find out there's something in that. Then you find out there's something in that. Then you find out there's something well, there's in something, that. There's something more um, sinister than what even what you just described. If you walk up to something and say, this is irreducibly complex, which means, of course, that there is no way this could have existed in a simpler form, and function. A- and function. And it contains some complexity, in, in either in that case or in another, some complexity that we will never understand, mm-hmm. thereby requiring some kind of intelligent force operating sure. on it. So here's, here's, here's what's particularly sin- – I have to use the word sinister mm-hmm, there. Mm-hmm. What's, not sinister. Inexcusably hubristic. It's right. – I can't figure out how this works. Exactly. And so no one <laughs> – <laughs> no one alive today can figure out how this works. No one who will ever be born will figure out how this works. Right. Therefore, it is intelligently designed. Right. That, that is the height of hubristic thinking. It's to, to assert that because you can't figure it out, no one who will ever be born after you will be able to do so as well. I mean, I don't want to, I don't, and I don't want to spark a, I don't want uh, people, uh, listen, if, if people who are listening are, you know, if you're, if you're very religious and you, even if you, even if you believe in creationism, I'm, I'm fine with whatever people want to believe, but I will, but when you look at the history, re, re, science has never truthfully had to ebb its definitions because of religion. That's and, correct. And, and, and it's correct. always been the reverse. And yet, That's correct. people still say, like, okay, okay, yeah, I know, I know all about that, about that. But this, this time, this has to be intelligently designed. Like, get what they were saying that 500 years ago about this other thing. What do you really? Really? Because yeah, in the end, people really just want to believe what they want to believe. Yeah. That's the answer. Yeah. And, they, and it's very difficult, I guess, to we, bridge these two You're concepts. approaching it like it's a rational conversation, but it's not. Right. So you just get on with life. Right. And you must And in a free to. society, we're allowed to have, you know, no there's no there's no tablet in the sky that requires that people think rationally. There is, it's an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm a very I'm a very big believer in like, hey, you know what? Whatever whatever you need to believe to feel happy and get through life, go ahead. Just don't, you know, don't I, you know, to a point, that's okay. I guess but then when you're blatantly wrong, it's just very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but some people don't mind even being wrong. They don't see the world that way. Yeah. It is, it is much easier. It is much easier to sort of adopt a prefab belief system, hand it to you, hand it to you, yes. rather than to have to investigate your own. It's much harder to actually figure it out yourself. And it's harder. It's harder to admit sometimes. Like I don't fucking know. I don't know. I don't know what this is. Right. And in science, if you can't admit you don't know, you will never make a discovery in your life. Yeah. The, uh, the scientist has to be not only comfortable with ignorance but embrace it because therein is that force that attracts you to the frontier. Where you put a foot in what is known, a foot in what is unknown, mm-hmm. and you investigate with the intent of discovery. And uh, so <laughs> you get these newspaper articles where a new science result comes out, and the lead the lead sentence is, "Science scientists will be sent back to the drawing board," and they're <laughs> they're baffled with it. I'm, if you're an active research scientist, you are always at the drawing board. You are always yeah. baffled. That is not a new state. That is a permanent state. And so the idea that a scientist might not know something is presented as some kind of 
major finding right. in the newspapers. But in fact, that's a daily finding. It just never it never stops. Yeah. The well, I was, I was going to say like wrong things that are wrong. Like for instance, in popular culture, I was just reading "Sky's the Limit," your memoir, which is very good. Pick it up. Get it on Kindle or buy the real book. Or buy an Kindle. actual book. Okay, I got it on Kindle, yeah. yeah thank uh, Thanks for the plug. We, we no, didn't absolutely. renegotiate that plug. No, no, no. You. We plug what we like here. We don't <laughs> plug it. things because we have to. Okay. No, we do because we like. <laughs> Unless there's a sponsor on this episode. <laughs> the, we, I, I, uh, okay. we don't know yet. Okay. Uh, uh, the sponsor <laughs> is uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Tyson. Um, but, uh, you know who the sponsor is? It's the radio show that I host that is lending me to you for this Star Talk. Star Talk. I have plugged your Star Talk radio. We have talked the shit out of Star Talk on the Nerdist podcast. Star Talk producers have lent me to you. They are, and I appreciate that they have. Well, you have, you know, uh, you. Eugene Merman is, is, a, is, a, is a pal well, of ours. These are your peeps, your comedic peeps. These are our peeps. And also, let me just say, and then I'm going to let Matt yeah, nerd no. out on you some more, but, but um, the, you know, I feel like uh, what you do is just this nexus of these two worlds is you, you have a foot in both worlds. You are a legitimate uh, scientist as, as director of the Hayden Planetarium and, and, and Nova Science Now and all the stuff, the stuff that you do. But also... You you kind of have a comics brain, which is which is a which is a rare. Is he complimenting me or is he yeah. helping me? Okay. It is. Yes. It's almost a dichotomy. Like it's a very interesting. Like you you live in these these two worlds where you can take these concepts, which you know. Um, I mean, listen. I, I Leon Letterman is a very funny. Is he's a funny guy, and the book is interesting, but. You know, it do, it is a it is a bit of a dry you know, and you are able to take these concepts and make them very relatable, well, which no, is so, huge. No, but so first, thanks for analogizing at least part of me to what goes on in the comedic world. I can tell you that the universe is fundamentally hilarious to me, <laughs> so I'm just really <laughs> sharing the, the 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 humorous things that I notice about the universe. I don't, I'll never start a conversation. Did you hear the one about the you know that's <laughs> you know so so. It's really just a, an observation about the universe that I just think is hilarious. And I also have deep respect for the comedic arts because I think the comedians are the keepers of all that we value in culture. They understand what people care about. They understand what upsets people. They understand what makes people laugh. And there's no other profession in this world that are experts at those simultaneously those three, three things. We're also well, narcissists. I don't know how I feel about this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're also very self-obsessed. Uh, we suffer yeah. from anxiety. I uh, cry a lot. But, but, beyond, but beyond all that, what is what is the sort of fun? Wait, wait, wait. we interrupted Matt five uh, minutes ago. But no, what I was going to say was one of the things I thoroughly enjoyed was how annoyed you were at Titanic's night sky. Oh! <laughs> Actually, I must announce that they're cutting a 3D version of Titanic, and there's more sky they want to add. And I got a phone call from. <laughs> from Jim Cameron's people to hand them a sky that they can use for the 3D version, which is going to come out, obviously, next year, because that's the anniversary, the centennial of the sinking of the ship. Oh, oh, that's right, yes. 2012. Excuse me. Oh, my gosh. And Fenway Park's construction. I don't care about that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so the nights sinking the- of the Titanic and Fenway Park. Right. Okay. <laughs> so Fine. they... So are, are there so the night the night sky in Titanic? I it was basically just a complete just an artist like poke poke poke. No, it, was, here. it was worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> if it was only that, I'd say okay. They just got they ran out of time. They ran out of budget. But it was worse than that. Now now I wouldn't even care. By the way, if he didn't tout the film as being historically accurate. Do you remember all of the campaigning that went on around the release of the film? He went in a submersible down to the sunken ship itself and shone light on the staterooms. <laughs> and he, he knows what the sconces and the, ch- the patterns on the dining, on the china and the silver. He had detail that none of us could actually double check. Yeah. And we just trusted that he was doing this right. I don't have a problem with that. But now he puts a sky over the sinking ship. We know the date, the time, the longitude, the latitude, <laughs> the weather conditions. We know where the moon was and was not on that night. There is only one sky Kate Winslet should have been looking at in her <laughs> delirious state. As she's paddling on that plank, looking up, singing something to herself. There's only one sky she should have seen, and it was the wrong sky. Not only was it... See, you got me started here. Please, Matt, continue. Uh, I'm going to give you music, Matt, bed. hold me back. <laughs> <laughs> Hold me back. So, it was not only the wrong sky, the left side of the sky was a mirror reflection 
wherever you are. Of the right side of the sky. <laughs> so it was not only the wrong sky, it was a lazy sky. And I was livid. I said, uh, you know, would you dress Leonardo DiCaprio in tie-dyed bell-bottoms for this movie? No, because it's in 1912. You, you, have, you, you want historical accuracy because that matters to the integrity of a movie. And so, yeah, I, I was all over him. I love, but I love the thing. idea of like if if there was a planetary affliction. Well, what's wrong? Ah, I got a little bit of a lazy sky. I gotta <laughs> he, go see a doctor. But, like his anger was like exactly what I felt. But it should be. It's his in profession. Tra- but in Transformers Three, I have to harp on this one more time. But they, you're saying there's something that wasn't accurate in Transformers Three? Well, there was a lot that wasn't accurate. But of all <laughs> wait, the things, wait, wait, wait. Dr. Tyson, please. <laughs> I, I know what I'm you're sorry. about to say, but please, okay. you should say it. You should I, say. I will, I will stay. No, shot. you should say it. I don't know. I, I but here, here was the one thing that I found. <laughs> egregious it was that they went to visit the moon the landing of site of apollo 11 and the ascent stage was still attached they would not have gotten off the moon well it was very i i got so mad at that i did I, m- oh because no one would recognize just the base that's the problem i would have you know what else though <laughs> well because you were deriving relativity in your seventh grade class so sure you would have. the other problem is that there's no planet-sized robots <laughs> no 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 uh they weren't planet-sized uh, Christopher, Unicron were... was a planet-sized robot. You Unicron Matthew. wasn't in the movie. Oh, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Whatever. Um, when, when, when Superman came out, the the, the original, yeah, the, the Richard movie. Donner, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what, he did the first one, did he? Richard Donner did the first one. Okay, yeah. so I, I was in the theater with my girlfriend, and at, towards the end, where Lois Lane dies, and he flies backwards around the mm-hmm. planet to reverse time. Yeah, she knows. You know, I'm the astrophysicist, right? So she asked me, uh, can, "Can he really? Is that really?" <laughs> And I said, he's a man in blue pant- pantyhose flying. <laughs> you know, like, are you not questioning anything else in this movie but that? You know? I mean, so it's interesting how people slice and dice what it is they want well, to question. But if you could reverse the planet, wouldn't the continents just all smash into each other? What would happen is you'd first have to stop the planet. And the act of stopping the planet would have everyone at this latitude fall over and roll due east 800 miles an hour, okay? First of all, <laughs> I imagine, just, just, yeah. just start there. Start there. Now you want to accelerate the thing back again. I'm going to tuck and roll, you guys. I'm going to let I'm tucking. I'm tucking. I'm just saying, okay? You're at 40 degrees north or south latitude. Your sideways motion as carried on Earth's rotation is about 800 miles an hour. The equator, they're going 1,000 miles an hour. You stop the rotation of the Earth, and you're not strapped down to Earth. It's the seatbelt law, by the way, writ large on Earth's plan- on a planet scale. You're not attached to the earth while the earth is slowing down you do not you still have that speed you'll roll over so it would have wreaked so much havoc on the earth he would have killed everyone everyone I, to save lois lane i would love to see one i would love to see someone like re like just add something on youtube or something where he starts spinning around and you see him going no and there's marlon Bruno going you will never interfere with human history and then he starts spinning and then they cut to a wide shot of the planet and you just see people flying out into space going fuck <laughs> like and then he just goes oh and then he just leaves earth he just leaves Earth, but he's completely destroyed the planet. But actually, I recently tweeted that if you're on the equator and you, we stopped rotating, that you would gain about a half a pound. Oh. Yeah. Because the rotation, the centrifugal force of the rotation is actually trying to fling you Oh, so it's surface. keeping your weight. No, no. It's, there is a weight that is your actual weight m- minus mm-hmm. the attempt of the Earth to fling you off of it. Okay. So at the, on the equator, if you weigh 150 pounds, you're 150, 160, you'd weigh a half a pound more. 142. If, well, okay. <laughs> a half a pound more. 281. Two, 281. Almost. Okay. So you honest. double that. So you'd be able to like a pound less. You're twice nice. me. Oh, thank God. Oh, good. <laughs> it used to be three times. You really thanking God for that? Is that was God <laughs> uh, responsible for this? Okay, excellent checking, point. Excellent just point. Just checking your, your religious point. assertions there. <laughs> so Santa would stay his same weight on the pole po- because there's no centrifugal force operating sure. on him. So that's, I just want to tell you that. It was, it was, as long as we were on the subject yeah. of the rotating Earth and its effects. Yep. Now, here's something really cool. Yes. All right. Rotate the Earth faster and faster. I'm going. I'm doing it. The Equatorians. Yes. These are the new speed, the new race of people, the Equatorians. <laughs> Those yep. half pound heavier people. Yeah, yeah, the, the, <laughs> oh, guys, they're the lead characters in the Ascent of the Cube. There you go. <laughs> the Equatorians in the Ascent of the Cube. The Equatorians will get lighter and lighter and lighter. And if you rotate Earth so that the equator is turning 17,000 miles an hour, yep. they will be weightless. Because at that speed, they would have oh. achieved orbit. So you can just stand there and weigh less and less and less. And the instant comes where you weigh nothing, you are in orbit around the Earth. You could that's, stop the Earth beneath your feet, and you would continue to stay in orbit just that, that way. That's what a lot of the Real Let's Housewives do are doing now to get to lose weight. 
Like, I'm just going to move faster to, uh, to my uh, orbital uh, speed. Yeah, so here's the problem. i got to get to my equatorial weight. People who want to lose weight, what they really want to do is lose mass. They want to lose mass, <laughs> yes. Because the mass is the material content of your Absolutely. body. Absolutely. What your scale shows changes if you're in orbit on the moon, on Mars. And flinging it back a little bit, when we discover the Higgs boson, Higgs boson we'll know exactly what it is that gives, proper, that gives mass. To the Higgs objects. boson is the grantor of mass to all particles. Yes. That is cool. It is really cool. And they're still looking for it. They haven't found it. The, the parameter space is shrinking on it. They'll probably find it, like, Wednesday or something. Guys, well, did you check under the pillows? Yeah, like, I know, sometimes, right? Sometimes, like, I, I sit down and shit falls out of my pockets uh, and there's stuff in the cushions. There goes the Bozar. <laughs> so what, so what would be, it'd be fun if we found it, but it'd be more fun if we didn't. Because that meant all the theories that we used to tell us that it should be there have to be revisited. Okay. We'll be back to the drawing board <laughs> <laughs> once again. Matt, uh, Matt said you, Matt, you, you talked about uh, you had sent me a thing which I haven't had a chance to watch yet, which was a oh, panel yeah, from uh, uh, from James Randi's uh, the Randi Foundation. The you and Bill Nye, the panel with Phil Plath mm-hmm. and Phil uh, Plath. There's Phil no Plath. H in this. Phil, Phil Plath, bad, bad astronomer, who's a friend of ours. Yeah, we follow each other. I'm, I'm good friends with Phil. He's a great guy. I know. I know. Good guy. Blogs for uh, Discovery. Yeah, d- 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 discussing the future of uh, NASA, past, NASA. present, and future of yeah. NASA. It was a panel at the um, a TAM. Ele- the Amazing yeah. Meeting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Amazing Meeting. Uh, TAM 11, I think. I've, they're counting them. Yeah. And so, and they're using base 10. So <laughs> 11 would not be the third one. It would be, you know. <laughs> it's the eleventh. It's yeah. he's he, uh, 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 that's. You uh, told me I could geek out. Oh, yeah, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, enjoyed yeah. it. You ever, you ever hear Tom? So Laird? we have zero one one zero oh, one one. That would be three in base two. Do you ever? Do you ever hear? Do you ever hear uh, Tom Lehrer's math song? I, I heard. I know his. He's. The, did he do the element song? He did the element yeah, song. I, I don't know if I know the math song. Uh, he has a he has a song called "The New Math," mm-hmm. which um, was is genius. I, you know what? Maybe oh, I'll play it at the end of this podcast. And please uh, don't sue me, Tom Lehrer. I, I'll play it for you after we do the show. He's, but then he does a whole thing in base eight. Okay. Uh, in in the song of like adding adding numbers, it and would it's, be octal. They it's, say it's brilliant. Uh, okay, so anyway, go ahead. The amazing oh, yeah. meeting. Adam Savage goes to those. Uh, Penn Jillette, uh, uh, oh, yeah. Paul Provenza. It's it's, it's a got really good people. Yeah, Paul Provenza. We went to high school. Did you go to Paul? Same, same, same. What you went to Provenza high school with Provenza? No, he's. I'm a little older than he is, but okay. he, he came after I did. You should do the green same, room same if he school. does more episodes of the green room. You should do it. I think I was in the green room. You were. I think they brought the green room to that conference. Did he, did he take oh, one there? Have, yeah. oh, I, well, he, he was did. sitting next to me for the recording. Okay, good. Would that have been the green room? That probably would have been the okay, green room. Okay, yeah, he was uh, there. That, That's a relief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so go go ahead, Matthew. I know, but you were discussing the uh, past, present, and future of NASA. Oh, on the panel, yes, yeah. yes. And uh, that's a very interesting subject to me. I went to the last shuttle launch. The, the STS-135. STS-135, uh, which I didn't I, – when it went up, I didn't expect it, but I cried. Because that you was teared. sort of the end. Can I tell you why you teared? Yes. Even if you don't understand it yourself, Please, go ahead. I'm going to tell you. Are you listening? Yes. Okay. Because I wrote a whole book on this. It's coming out in February, February oh, 27th. What's it actually. called? What's it called? Well, I'll tell you what I was. What it was called, and then the publisher said it was too depressing, and I had to change it. <laughs> the title of the book, as I wrote it, was "Failure to Launch: The Dreams and Delusions of Space Enthusiasts." That's a compelling title <laughs> to me. The publisher, that's too depressing. It's got the word "failure" in it. No one will buy it, so we had to change the title. Happy Space Time. Okay. <laughs> It was, it's called Space Chronicles. I'd buy both of those, Happy Space Time and Failure. <laughs> Here is why you teared. You teared, and I, by the way, I tweeted that entire... No, I was watching. While was, the shuttle is loading up into... I'm all in it, yeah. okay? You cried, not because it was the last shuttle, but because there was not another spacecraft to replace it in the adjacent launch pad. Did you cry? Would you have cried during the ending of the Gemini program? No. Knowing that the mighty Apollo. Saturn V was sitting adjacent to it, ready to take us to the moon? Your tear is not the ending of the shuttle missions. It is the lament that there is nothing to replace it to continue our dreams into the future. And that was extraordinarily depressing, especially when we were, because we, I was at... Just this, so clarify, yeah. you're depressed not for the end of the shuttle, but nothing's next to it. There's Just nothing ready to go. admit that to yourself. There's nothing ready to go. Fine. There's nothing ready to there go. There it is. They had mock-ups of the Orion. Yeah. It's not built. Yeah. What do you think about... It might the, not ever get built. What do, what do you think about all this going into the private sector, like the... It's uh, not all going into the private sector. This is all in the book, by the way. You should invite me back. We'll talk about the book. You can come back every day <laughs> if you want. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I would be happy this is to my replace first, Jonah. This, you've, been on, you've been doing this stuff for 20 years, and this is my first invitation I ever got from you. 
I so, <laughs> oh, we've tried. You know, well, at least I've tried. Okay. On I've, I've tweeted at you before, but you have so many followers. You, 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 you tweeted at me. You, you have to tweet to me, not at me. I, but I at replied well, you. At reply. oh, I'm sorry. I'm just, at kidding. Replied I'm just kidding. You. <laughs> I wasn't able to uh, direct message you. Yeah. Um, right. until, until you follow at Nerdist. All right. I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't or at Matt Myra. I mean, whatever. It's just like no. He can't follow both of us. I'm sorry. Uh, no, actually, right. he not fair. Yeah, could, choose yeah. between you, and yeah. I'll know. Go ahead. So yeah. So the the private sector will never lead any kind of frontier of discovery. It has never done in the history of our species because when you advance a frontier, which by definition is going where no one has gone before, it costs you things that cannot be valued in the capital markets. The risks are too high. So, for example, the Dutch East India Trading Company, Mm -hmm. which was trading all around the world, they were not the first to go from Europe to America. Mm -hmm. That was Columbus. These were government monies that took those risks, that put the – that had motivation that was not specific – in their case, not specifically economic. In fact, it was hegemonistic. We love that word. (laughs) But didn't the Vikings originally privatize? That's uh, what – apparently, but they had no real significant lasting effect. They didn't bring syphilis back to Europe. Nor did they write it down. No. So we didn't get that. Exactly. So it's – the first one that mattered was Columbus, basically. So the nations – Engage in discovery. They map the, ch- they, they create the charts. They map the paths. They patent the new discoveries, the, the new uh, technologies necessary to accomplish it. Mm-hmm. When it becomes routine, then it cedes to private enterprise and then they take over. Okay. That's how it has always been. So, private enterprise will not be the first on Mars. It'll be some country. If not America, China. perhaps China. Thank you. Uh, the next, back to the moon, it will not be private China. enterprise. Private, private enterprise will go to low Earth orbit where we've been. The patents have been awarded. And if they can get that nice and cheap, NASA should set them anything they need to access low Earth orbit by that route. But don't you think that the idea of <laughs> – even the idea of countries are – when you think that Facebook has 750 million users and Apple has more money Space than – Facebook? F- Spacebook. Okay. Facebook. I'm joining that. Where, that where, where is that? I'll friend you on Spacebook. That's the uh, – no, no, no. That's the, that's the enterprise social network. <laughs> that's where they all – oh, Spock, why are you why did you Wesley, block me? Wesley, why are you friending no, me no, on no, Spacebook? Spock it's, blocked me again. While we I, are, got, I got Spock blocked. While we're inventing vocabulary, Spacebook is the social network in the ascent of the cube. It is okay. – Yes, no, where anywhere. the Equatorians We're, are trying to uh, exactly. uh, uh, break to lose orbit. weight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to lose weight. That's how they made movies in the 50s, Oh, my God. <laughs> so, but when you consider that Facebook – yeah, that was a Corman film we yeah. just made. When you consider that Facebook has 750 million users and Apple has more money than the government, why – but how, why couldn't they – Oh, they could, they could. They just wouldn't make money on it. Oh, OK. Right. They could. They have enough money. But uh, if you want to call it a business – the premise is that at the end of the day, there's a return on the investment, an ROI. There is right. no ROI when you are breaking a frontier. What are some of the weirdest experiments that you know of that have been done on the sh- in space that that peop- that a lot of people don't know about? They must have tried everything in in space. Uh, there's some fun ones, like does a, does a fish know which way is up when it's sitting water, a blob of water? Uh, what happens to a, a spider when it spins a web? Does it think about gravity? It turns out many small creatures, gravity is an almost insignificant thing to them. That's why, you know, they're insects and just crawl up your wall and crawl on the ceiling. Right. Gravity is just kind of this incidental force that is just more of an annoyance than anything that they actually have to deal with. You look at microbes that thrive inside of pond scum mm-hmm. or droplets of water. They don't care about gravity. Whole other worlds of forces are operating that matter more to them than gravity. So we talk about, let's go into zero G and see what's different. There's whole swaths of the animal and plant kingdom that couldn't care rat's tail about what about the fact that they were in orbit. Th- some of this was captured in the film A Bug's Life, the bar scene. In the bar scene, they did not use the bugs, right? Yeah. And so, so they actually are little things. They did not use a cup to give the guy the Bloody Mary, okay? Uh, the, the the mosquito. The guy. They just brought some blood. I forgot how it was water. They added blood to, but it was a blob of water, and they relied on surface tension to keep the shape of the water oh, right. in front of him at the bar stool. That's pretty genius. It's genius. It's, it is, let us put some actual laws of chemistry and physics in a bug's life and, and, and exploit it to the benefit of the comedy of the show. But well, surely, and, are, what can't you do? sorry to take it blue, but sh- certainly people have masturbated in space or tried to get pregnant in space. or so, like, Haven't they done exper- experiments to see if we can procreate? In, I'm, not uh, on- th- I'm not authorized to that, Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> that means yes. Actually, speaking of... Uh, I'm if, not programmed if you, to if respond you, in that If area. you have to go there, uh, if you're actually in space, any part of you that is ejected from your physical body, the rest of your body will recoil. 
just, just consider that. Okay? I'm just, that's Newton's law of motion right Sorry, there. sweetheart. I got, I got a wicked kick. Okay. Okay. So you might want to stand back. We got to do this up against the wall because I'm going to play. And most acts of sex would require straps because you'd be bouncing off the walls in zero G. Mm-hmm. Um, but but do, would would there be enough? See, I'm trying to keep you guys a little higher than you than where you normally fall. And we're trying to drag you down, <laughs> so we have this perfect this perfect balance. It's a tension that resolves. <laughs> but with 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 uh, bone density loss, and to, like, could, could people cro- procreate in in space, or would would it would it make a pregnancy? too? did we need? Is there anything that about gravity that that pregnancy needs? There's no known. There's no known. There's nothing known that would prevent. Mm-hmm. A woman from either getting pregnant, going to term, and actually giving birth. In fact, the movement of the sperm up the fallopian tube is not gravitational. Right. I mean, you can get pregnant standing up. Okay. It's all muscle contractions and things. And so birth is a sequence of muscle, muscle contractions. You can give birth upside down. It's just less comfortable. Sure. Upside down on earth. So yeah. if you can give birth upside down and right side up on earth, you can give birth in zero G. One of the big questions before we first went into orbit was, can you swallow in space? Oh, wow. Little basic functions. Yeah, they didn't know your organs would work. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. And so, but they could have probably reasoned that out because you can swallow upside down. Mm-hmm. That's why you see these beer drinking contests where the guy drinks a beer upside down, balancing on his head. If you can dr- drink upside down and right side up, then with zero G, there's no... Those are the two opposites of gravity operating on you. So you ought to be able to do it in the middle. There's something called a mean value theorem okay. in math that allows the middle to always be there if the two extremes are working for you. Um, this uh, this was something that I actually didn't didn't know, uh, and I was disappointed in myself for not knowing this until a couple no, of years. No, wait, we'll be disappointed in you. Go you on. can be. Please okay. disappoint me. Was not understanding. I was like, wait a minute. So, you know, we're all, all the, you know, we, we have these uh, eight and a half planets orbiting the sun. Eight. <laughs> eight planets eight. orbiting the sun. Eight. Pluto was not even a half a planet. It's not okay? a dwarf planet. I know. Right. I know you're a big. Yeah, I say, yes, I know. It's in the Kuiper Belt. Come on. Do you know? The, do you know the moon is five times the mass of Pluto? I mean, just get over it. Okay. <laughs> it's an ice block, right? It's basically it's a chunk of ice. Yeah. And yeah. It's, I think it's happier now, right? Because it's it's a dwarf planet reigning king among other dwarf planets, right? And so it's got to be a happier situation. Like, like in a Breakfast Club, where Anthony Michael Hall says, "Yeah, I'm kind of like king of the dipshits." Like yeah. that's that's Pluto. Uh, but I never knew. I, I never. I never knew. Like, wait, did you all, actually say that in the Breakfast Club? In the Breakfast Club? And I'm not the Breakfast Club. Sixteen Candles. Oh, I'm sixteen, sorry. Right, sixteen I, Candles. I remember the Breakfast Club. I'm sorry. I. I, I, I Plus, Anthony Michael Hall wasn't in. He was. He was oh. in both of them. Was he the nerd kid? He was the nerd kid okay. in both of them. That was Matthew Michael Hall. Anthony oh, yeah, of Michael Hall. Of course. Did you see the license plate that is of the car that his father drove to pick him up in? No. It said equals MC squared. Oh, that's How's awesome. that for trivia? That's, that is good trivia. Geek trivia. Nice. In the breakfast club, nice. the geek kid who in the, was in this physics club, that meant yeah. his, his parents are physics folks as well. Yes, and they wanted to hammer that home, so and they and put that. Is. And, you, and the, it's a low camera angle when he gets in the car as they all scatter to, their, to the winds yep. at the end of the program. As and Simple Minds plays everyone out. As simple, mm-hmm. I love Simple Minds. And then the, the, the plate goes by. And yeah. You get to see it. Glittering Prize, Greatest Hits of the Great, Simple Minds, great album. Mm. Great album, mm-hmm. by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I didn't. I had to ask someone. So, oh, I asked someone at the uh, Flandreau Science Center. This is where we're going to be disappointed in you. Yes, you're yes. about to be disappointed, and I apologize. I asked someone. I went to the Flandreau Science Center uh, in Arizona. It's a little, a little tiny observatory there. Uh, are all the planets on the same plane? Like, are some planets and that, that we would perceive are, are higher than others, or are they all? Is it sort of like on one like horizontal plane that orbits uh, the sun? That's what I. That's what I had never really thought about what? before. So, so what are you embarrassed by? Well, because I just felt like it's and it was an obvious question. So, and did you get an answer? I did get an answer. So then I don't understand what your problem is. Well, I, I just I felt like I should have known that. There and are no I, stupid questions. Oh, 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 oh! So the issue is not that the question was stupid, but that you should have known it long ago. I felt like that, is yeah, that, that's yeah. a pretty basic question. Yeah, that, that's the first week of Astro One Hundred and One. Yeah, yeah. So you failed that one. God. Yeah, yeah. So the planets are all approximately in the same plane. The the most tipped out of the plane is Pluto, mm-hmm. seventeen degrees out. And that's what a, a jerk. It's such a it's such a loser. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and that's not even that's that just the, the scratching the surface <laughs> of its antisocial behavior. It crosses the orbit of Neptune. It, 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 Pick it, up the Pluto files while you're buying oh, those other books. Oh, thank you. Please. Uh, well, as long that's as great. we're and I know that's on Kindle, by the way. The yes, Pluto it is. files. Thanks for the, the second your second plug for me of the day. And so so Pluto's tipped 17 degrees out. Next one that's most tipped is um, Mercury. Okay, is tipped. Uh, what is that about? Is it Mercury or, or, or uh, damn, well, I'm embarrassed now. Whoa. I think it's Tatooine. 
Oh, that one. <laughs> Planet Vulcan. That's the one that's It did. was yeah. Alderaan. But here's the thing. So they're all approximately the same plane, and they're all moving in the same direction. Mm-hmm. And that point did not go unremarked upon by scientists of the past, Mm -hmm. which is what led to what was called the nebular hypothesis, that the solar system was not just a star that captured planets, because you were capturing them randomly. Some would go in one direction, others would go in other directions. Mm -hmm. Some would orbit top to bottom, rather than all in a disk. Sure. So, since they're all in a disk, and in the same direction, then that tells you that they must have something common about their origin. And the nebular hypothesis is that the whole solar system was a big gas cloud that all rotated coherently, Mm -hmm. the center formed the sun, and all the planets distributed themselves out to the edges of where you had gas available. And there's nothing that is exactly in the same position on the opposite side of the sun, orbiting at the same speed. You mean like Journey to the Far Side of the Sun, that movie? There was a movie. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, a little before your time, Yes, I think. I'll say yes, even There's though I don't movie, know There's a Journey it. to the Far Side of the Sun. So they launch from Earth, mm-hmm. and half the mission length later, they come back to Earth. And they say, did you abort the mission? What, what's up? Turns out, they found another planet that orbited exactly opposite Earth across from the Sun. And That's had all scary. the same people there. Everything was, was the same, except left was right, and what? right was left. What? What the? That was... A mirror world. It was a mirror world. Oh, my God. Mirror world. Now, here's one thing that was not a mirror world. The guy goes home. The, one of the astronauts goes home, kisses his wife. Mm-hmm. The wife knew. This is not my man. Uh-oh. Looks like him, you know, walks like him, talks like him. So there must be some left-right thing going on in their tongue. She was cheating on the guy with <laughs> the guy from the mirror world. <laughs> Funny. So the, 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 the punchline, you know, spoiler alert here, how do you – they figure this out. It takes them a while. Each planet is figuring it out. And they fig, to launch them, they have to know whether the polarity is also switched because that affects the launch code. Yep. Okay. And so they take a guess that the polarity is not switched, even though left right is, and they were correct. And that's that's a wise move because very polarity. very wow. sciencey reasoning for a movie. Very, especially for a first run movie. That was not some indie movie. That was a first run movie. How do I I miss this? How long? I, how old is this movie? Because right, you can take a magnet, you can take a bar magnet and put it in the mirror. Yep. North is still north, and south is still south, but left right is switched. So yep. they they thought that one through. It's from the, I think sixty nine. Okay. Okay. Sixty seven around there. Now, I'm curious. What do you do? What is what is an average day for you? Uh, consist of uh, you know like when you're not doing Star Talk or you're not right. Like what what is it? What is an average sign? Day for you. The standard deviation on my activities is so large that to speak of an average would be meaningless. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> how, do you, how do you conduct astrophysics? What did you do on, what did you do on Monday? <laughs> so, uh, so, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell you the kinds of things that happens to me in a month. Okay. Okay. In a month, I'll give several lectures mm-hmm. across the country, around the world. I do Star Talk Radio. Uh, that's a weekly uh, radio program. Which also, everyone should subscribe also, to. Also, download. also podcast. And if I can uh, give a cheap plug, start, please. StarTalkRadio.net. That, that is net. not a cheap plug. Dot net, is, everybody. You got it. StarTalkRadio.net. All, all one word. And I also um, I also care about my Twitter following. Yes. I, they care about what I share with them. And so I take, uh, it's, a, it's, an, it's a responsibility mm-hmm. that I've taken on. He doesn't waste tweets. I've noticed that. Yeah, thank you. Man. You're right. He does thank, not waste see, He pays attention to me. You, <laughs> you, you pretend like you pay attention. He, he knows what I was doing when I was nine. He's stalking you. <laughs> okay. I like you a I lot. I just read and absorb. Matt okay. wants to cut you open and live in your skin. Okay, so we just... we got to get to that. Just, I don't know when this will post, but just yesterday, I, I went a little overboard with my tweets. I got on a periodic table of elements kick. Okay. Because yesterday was announced, just announced that a new element was officially named after Nikolai Copernicus. Okay. Copernicium. All right. And I was just so jazzed by that. I said, Let, let's just spend a day celebrating the periodic table. So I had like a dozen tweets just just totally rocking the periodic table. <laughs> and so uh, so some part of my day thinks about uh, the tweets that I give and uh, what my presence on Facebook. So there's some social media sure. in there. I'm also I'm running the programs of the Hayden Planetarium, mm-hmm. although I'm on a kind of a sabbatical now because I have other activities, one of which was rising up in my life's priorities is we are making the 21st century version of Carl Sagan's Cosmos. I read that. Whoa. Yes. I read that you were yes. doing that. that yes. and, you, and you knew, you knew Dr. It doesn't Dr. count Dr. if you tell me that after I already told you. <laughs> 
because then I'd have no evidence that you actually <laughs> read it. I was not aware of that. I would have yes. plugged that. Yeah, okay. So that's what I thought. If you'd actually read it in advance, you would have you led with that. So uh, I'm teaming up with two of the original three creative principles mm-hmm. of the original Cosmos, and we're making 13 episodes, and we're going to we're going to air for, on Fox for, for 2013. For PBS. What on? Fox. I don't believe you. I, it's totally true. On Fox? On, d- 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 the American Idol Network? No, the American Idol Network. The Fox News Network. No, the- I, but I, I did know this, and I was going to talk to this about your relationship to, do- to, to Dr. Sagan, because yeah. I, I know, it's, it's isn't it called like Cosmos, a personal voyage? Or His a- was a personal voyage. My, Cosmos, a space-time a journey. space-time journey. Yeah. Okay. okay. STJ. <laughs> oh, my God. You no, totally should. We gotta, we're, we're working on how, how we'll shorten that, but yeah, that's, that's the operating title right now. Did you ever hear that Symphony of Science song? Oh, there's they- tons of them. There's several. Yeah. There's, there's, there's like at least a half a dozen. Yeah, the glorious dawn. Yeah, oh the, yeah, the great. And I'm in a few of them, so I'm, I'm honored that the the creativity of the musicians thought to include me. What's what? So what is what is your goal with? Oh, well, your, there's more that I do. So no, no, I, 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 I uh, when the universe flinches, I get phone calls mm-hmm. from the press. They need a sound bite, and the universe is flinching like weekly lately. All right, in a couple of days, we're gonna get a buzz cut from an asteroid that'll come between us and the moon. Whoa. It is 400 meters across. If this hit, it'd be a bad day on that sector of the Earth. But we're okay for now. And But it will hit us one day, and so you want to keep an eye on these things. That's So they're, they're, I'm getting calls to comment on that. There's uh, So there's always something going on, and so I, I, I try to stay off the streets by, in, in so doing. <laughs> and I'm also writing. You know, I, that's my one of my favorite activities is writing. And I have a, a small part of me that's still doing active research, but I want to grow that fraction again when most of this is off my table, most of the rest of the, the public stuff. What's your, what's your underlying goal? And the reason that I, that I ask this is because— My goal uh, to, to move to a desert island with Internet and never have to leave it. <laughs> that's not bad. Yeah. What? It's unrealistic, but that's— Richard Branson did it. He but, has an island. Yeah, he, he bought the island. Yeah, you can yeah, buy I'm an island. I'm moving to an island, but yeah, sure, I'll buy an island. <laughs> that's all you need. <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we could do yeah, that. Yeah, I just, I, I'm a servant of the public's interest in the universe. I don't actually seek it out. About People don't know this. About 15% of the time you see me on Colbert or Daily Show, about 15% of those times, it's because I have like a book and the marketing people want to hawk the book. Sure. The other 85% of the time, it's because the universe flinched and they want a soundbite. And so in that capacity, I'm a servant of the public appetite of the universe. I don't get big-headed about it. I'm happy to be able to serve that role. But when I wake up in the morning, I'm not saying, what new media outlet can I exploit today? That is not going through my head. I meant more along the lines of like... Of I'd like, stay home and play with my kids. Of educating people or trying to stamp out ignorance or really trying to, to enlighten people as what, far as science. When I am called, I'm happy to serve that role. Yeah. I'd still rather just stay home with my kids. And the- I'm a late breeder. So uh, my daughter's fifteen. My uh-huh. son is ten. Oh, she's a she's a big Doctor Who fan, by and the way. she is right to be so. Total You're... Whovian. Yes. One one week. She she uh, <laughs> when when she finally got bitten. Yep. She downloaded seventy nine episodes Sweet. of Doctor Who. Sounds like someone and got the bill. Spent an entire week. Watching them. Excellent. She, she did not leave her computer that weekend. After that, she emerged. Wow. A Dalek hater. She, <laughs> okay, she was, <laughs> everything I know about Doctor Who comes through her tutelage. She so sounds really know. cool. What's your daughter's and name? She's a fan of yours. And I, I, I got up to notch oh by, by telling that I'd be on your show. What is her, what's her name? I'm, I can't tell. Okay. Sure. Did, uh, she, did she watch our special? It aired right after Doctor Who. She probably saw it. Right, so. right, right, right. I didn't think to ask her if she watched the special. I just want but. to say to your daughter that uh, uh, st- stay in the Whovian universe. Uh, you are awesome, and thank you so much <laughs> uh, for, being, for being cool. Um, my, I guess all, uh, you know, I, we, we have to wrap it up here in a minute because uh, we're going to actually we're gonna do Star Talk, which I'm, I'm thoroughly Thank you. We about. got you right after this to um, be, be my co-host on Star Talk. Oh, yeah. my God. That's so huge. We're going to talk about time. I'm excited to Excellent. talk about time. It's really weird for me because I'm going to – it's like I'm losing one that I usually get on a Sunday. It's like <laughs> now it's happening now. <laughs> yeah, sorry you have I'll to see it live, happens. you ungrateful yeah. jerk. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, uh, people can find you uh, at uh, uh, on Star Talk, uh, StarTalkRadio.net. Yeah, that's how you listen to all the back episodes. You have some fun guests in the pa- of the past, including some sort of A-listers. Like we had Morgan Freeman. Mm-hmm. We had – and I asked him, you know – 
say something in that voice. And he said, hello, Dr. Tyson. <laughs> it was like, I felt like slapping him. I said, Morgan, you're live. Give me that voice. He probably, he probably, he probably gets that all the time. He was like, do the penguin's voice. Do, that, do the narration thing that you do. Yeah, so. Tell me how Andy escaped from Shasha. <laughs> how he climbed through all kinds of filth I can't even imagine. Um, you're also at Neil Tyson on Twitter. At Neil Tyson on Twitter. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, of course. And, and I, don't, I don't tweet what I have for breakfast unless I'm giving you the count of quarks in sure. the breakfast cereal. It would, uh, it's, prime, it's not where I am and what I'm doing. It's just thoughts that I have in any given day that merge sort of what the world looks like through the lens of a scientist and how I might express that through the lens of an educator. And, 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 it, it, and a human. There's a humanity to what you do. I'll give you an example. One tweet that got heavily retweeted. I might re- put it out again because it was back in, from the old days, sure. like a year ago. Yep. <laughs> it was, I was driving down the street and I saw the stoplight and I said, hmm, I wonder if we had copper in our blood to carry our oxygen rather than iron, mm-hmm. then our blood would be green. And if that were the case, what color would the stoplight be? Oh. It's red because it's blood. We fear blood. Right. That's danger. It's a danger color. If your blood is green, then green is danger, but then so too are plants. So I was just wondering what kind of dilemma we would have confronted if that were the case. This sort of, this sort of, uh. That's this... A, it's a thought. I, I didn't, I didn't invent that for the tweet. That's just a thought I'm having. And so I said it would be a waste if I just kept this bottle between my ears. <laughs> so I said, let me share this with the Twitterverse. And that's what the, that's what my tweets are. They're shared, shared outlooks on our, on our place in the universe. Is that is there, is there some sort of a is there some sort of a butterfly effect uh, uh, cause and effect thing that happens with that where you cha- you change one thing and then everything else in the world? It could happen because every red light that now means danger wouldn't mean danger. We just wouldn't know what to make of the color. The color would have no emotional. Oh, meaning that to light's us. all bloody. I don't know. It's, it's tell me. It's tell me to bleed. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. What's, what's, what's no, there mean. could be other creatures with red blood that just wouldn't be us. Like Spock has green blood. Spock has green Star blood. Trek. He sure does. Yep. And crustaceans have green blood. They have copper based. Uh, uh, hemoglobin. That'd be so cool. What to cut open a crustacean? No, to have copper blood. Um, I, I, I do. Uh, I, I it turns one... out it's not as efficient transporting oxygen, so we're better with our iron blood. All right, I'll stick with the but, iron. Oh, plus, oh, you want to? Oh, I like when you. If you propagate that back through, Mars would have never been the god of war. The planet Mars would not represent the god of. Oh, because it's not red. red. It would have been red. red. Yeah, it's red. And it's just red. I had an idea for a show oh, once that mind. I pitched yeah. to PBS, and they didn't want to go for it, but it, it was called uh, "Fe Chef Iron Chef." Uh, oh! Okay, and, uh, and, and it was like basically like you take a couple scientists or 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 science teachers, you give them the same handful of elements, and then they just have to make stuff with Makes, them. That's great. They didn't. Uh, TBS didn't pick it up. Nah, they yawned by the time I finished the sentence. You could have called me up. I would. Uh, we're gonna make, uh, we'll make, make that chef. work. We'll I, make will, and I want to be your first chef. <laughs> please, please. I will so blow some stuff up. I'll ho- I'll host it. I'll <laughs> host it all dramatic style. And let me go a little more geek on you. If you take a a a pattern of six. Iron atoms, mm-hmm. Fe, and you connect them in, in your sort of uh, Lawson diagram, mm-hmm. Lawson's diagram, you remember from chemistry? Yes. You know, okay. So Fe, Fe, Fe. Mm-hmm. So you say, well, what is that? It's a Ferris wheel. Oh, that's awesome. A oh. little bit of geek humor for you there. I knew, I knew someone who had like an orange, uh, like a tabby cat, and the cat was orange, and he called him Ferris, F-E-R-R-O-U. That's cute. Right? It is right? Cute. right? And it was like Ferris, like Ferris Bueller. No, no, Ferris, no. like iron. Yeah, um, there was a Ferris before a Ferris Bueller. There yeah, was, yeah, yeah. a long believe, time. Mm-hmm. I don't believe you guys. My last question for you is, has there been anything that has happened uh, since you have been a scientist, When they, I mean, obviously when they come to you when the universe flinches, where you've said... Well, by the way, they come to others as well. It's just that I happen to live in New York. Sure. Where the major news gathering headquarters sure. are. Sure, And so I'm a cheap date for the media. <laughs> That's all. I don't, like I said, I don't get big-headed about this. I'm just a servant. Okay. You do have a... Is it a comet named after you or... I have an asteroid. You have an asteroid named yeah, after you. It's not headed towards Earth. I, I double, Before I accepted the honor, I double-checked to see Good. If, whether it was headed what towards Earth. What is it? 13, 5, 22, something like that. The 1, 3, 2, 1, 3, 1, 2, 3? Exactly. 1, 1 3, 1, 2, 3, three Tyson. Yeah. 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 See? I know shit. <laughs> I read it. I forgot it. It's a main belt asteroid. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But has there been anything that has happened where you have actually gone, oh, shit, this might actually not be good for all of us, or is everything ultimate? And you want me to tell you that now? Oh, no, I guess not. Huh? Yeah, I see? do. Yeah. Yeah, here's one. Apophis is on its way. It's a 300-meter cl- class asteroid, and it's got a collision course with Earth. It will come in 2029 close enough to Earth to dip not simply inside of the moon's orbit. That's nothing. Sure. It'll come closer than Earth's orbiting communication satellites. 
Oh. Talk about a buzz cut. There's a buzz cut if there ever was one. We will only know then, unless we can tag its ear in Lojack style before then, to know exactly where it is in its orbit. Right now, we kind of know where it is in its orbit. And because we only kind of know where it is in its orbit, we can't tell you what it will do next after that. Okay. The uncertainty is too high. And in that uncertainty includes the possibility of Apophis, named for the Egyptian god of death and darkness. Okay. Apophis hitting Earth. And if it hit er, hits, hits Earth, it'll hit us... Uh, in 2036 on April 13th. By the way, April 13th, 2029 is a Friday. Oh! Yeah, just, to, just to put that in, in context. That's the main one in the Ascent of the Cube, uh, oh. <laughs> which were, Apophis is the main guy the, the, in, in there Ascent, it is. Of the Ascent of the Cube. There it is, Ascent of the Cube with the uh, Equatorians. Equatorians. It's going to be yeah. a good one, you guys. Um, yeah. Now I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> I thought this was going to be a past thing, like, but then no. we were okay. Oh, it's all going to be fine, everyone. <laughs> That's Who's who's even going to remember by then? Uh, but anyway, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Tyson. It was a pleasure to have you on. Happy, I'm very excited and, and to do Star Trek. don't be such a stranger. I'm here for you. I won't. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we will hug it out. Thanks, uh, Matt. Thanks. All right. Enjoy your space burrito, everyone. Oh, <laughs> nice. It was really fun to watch you play with a Rubik's Cube uh, a minute ago outside. Are you, are you a Rubik's Cube fanatic? You're revealing this to people. No, I'm not a fanatic. I, I, when I was in graduate school, when I really should have been studying for graduate exams, <laughs> the Rubik's Cube would just showed up, and uh, I was committed to solve it. And I didn't want to solve it through anybody's instructions. Mm -hmm. People buy books so they can speed up faster and faster. I've never read a book, but I ultimately solved it, like, 400 hours later. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and the fastest I ever did it was 76 seconds. Oh, my God. Well, that was in my day. Okay. We all have our day. Sure. Surely you had a day when you did something in 76 seconds. I did, yeah. <laughs> uh, to the detriment of the young woman I was with. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so I... Uh, but now it just showed up. I mean, I did it once on, on Jon Stewart. And so now, like, people are sending me Rubik Cubes. It's, no, it's not a, I'm not fanatic about it. Because there is, there's another Chris Hardwick in the world, and that guy is actually, this is a true story, he's actually a Rubik's Cube champion. And there are videos of other Chris Hardwick solving blindfolded, solving Rubik's Cube with one hand. You go to his website, and he has these, like, crazy theoretical cubes that you have to solve with math, where they're just like, you know, X to the N, sided cubes. So, so he's crossed over. He is crossed over. Now, now here, yeah. here's where I don't boast about my, my, what I can do with a Rubik's Cube. Because online, there's a Korean girl who is four, sitting in a high chair, solves the Rubik's Cube in four minutes. Hmm. We're done. Yeah. We're done. You can't follow that. You can't follow that. Just let, <laughs> and her hand candy isn't even big enough to hold the cube. And she solves it in four minutes. So I said, this is just a hobby. It's not a... Is there, uh, are there other people that can see the logic of the cube and understand how to manipulate three-dimensional space uh, to do their bidding? <laughs> do you I, I guess there are, but most people I know who are really good at it just did a lot of reading. And yeah. I said, what good is that? Then you didn't really solve the puzzle. You found the recipe to solve the puzzle. I, the first time I solved it, I had wedged all the pieces out and put them back you together. You can. You can pull them back. And some people say, well, you didn't solve it. I go, it's a different kind of problem solving. And, and I, I was hoping you wouldn't say you remove the stickers. <laughs> no, well, I tried that once, <laughs> that's, too. That's also a solution in principle. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah it's not the intended one. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's basically just the, uh, that's the superficial solution, which, unfortunately... Here's the problem. We, in our culture are breeding people who care more about the answer than the path to the answer. Of course. So that we say, solve this, they just pull out the stickers, look, it is solved, mm -hmm. but they actually have no meaningful solution path to get there. Right. Because we don't promote pathways, only the right answer. And that this is a problem, a well, deep, a deep, a deep, deep, uh, it's shortcoming of our it's education a, Because system. we're impatient. We're impatient and we, want, we, we, we are addicted to convenience. Yeah, I'd rather, okay, you're impatient, but the day you actually have to solve something, what do you do? You, you're, you're, you're up, nothing. You're, 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 you're stumped. What you need to do is when you're looking at a black hole, you just need to rearrange the stickers on it. That's the lesson that's learned here. I just need to rearrange. Oh, the problem, okay, here's the problem with these planets. You just need to move the stickers around. No, 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 here it is. No, no, it's, it's, it's because we're also a multiple choice society. Right. right? And I figured this out, my, my, my sister I said, you know, let's go out to lunch. Where do you want to go? You know her reply was? What are my choices? <laughs> I'm thinking, invent something out of your head. Come up with something on your own. Because we only get multiple choices. And if you're about to fall into a black hole, what do you do? Our brain is saying, well, what are my choices? Mm -hmm. When maybe 
the actual answer is a pathway not imagined by the person who gave you the choices to begin with. Maybe you're cleverer than they are. Interesting. So if you're ever in that lifeboat and there's only food for four, but there's six people, do you eat the other two? Do you throw them overboard? Usually you're given a set of choices. My reply to that is, I'm cleverer than the person who set up those choices. I might find another way to create a net, gather fish, so we don't have to eat the other two people on the lifeboat. Sure. There could be solutions you haven't thought of. What if one of them looks delicious? <laughs> <laughs> had you thought about? I hadn't, I hadn't considered that fact. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think. But there's also there's also a problem with having, you know, people think they want choices, but then it's stressful when you have too many choices. Yeah, like we just renovated, and I had to choose the color paint for the walls. Mm -hmm. It's like there should not be that many choices. You can have any. Co you went Tardis blue, right? <laughs> Tardis that's, blue. That's the only color you. <laughs> That's acceptable. That's a nice blue. Isn't it is it? a nice blue. It's a deep blue. It's, that's a cool blue. It's a good blue. Tardis blue. Yep, it's, uh, it's been all over the universe. It's a little dark for a room, though, I think. <sighs> all right, so on the outside of your Tardis. Would you paint the, uh, the doorway Tardis blue? That would work. And then, But then, then inside you, then is you your portal, laboratory. Right. Yeah. Um, so we're on the set of Star Talk right now, the, te the, the video version of Star Talk. Um, and uh, I, I'm super excited. You, you've, you've, re you've been wrangling some great talent on the show as well. Well, they, I, I think it's, you know, we've had Morgan Freeman, we've yep. had Whoopi Goldberg, we've had, uh, who else we had? We've had, um, uh, give me some names. Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman, thank you. We had Dr. Ruth. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so Dr. Ruth. Dr. Ruth. You had Dr. Ruth. Yes. She must be in her. She was in this chair yesterday. Oh, my God. Yes. Was she standing on it? it? She's wee. She's I didn't a wee know lady. if she was standing or sitting. There's no, <laughs> no, she, she's, a, she's a tiny lady. She's actually quite uh, candid about her height. She's 4'7", in case uh -huh. you were wondering. Yes. A few inches shorter than average, but yep. she's, she's a mighty mo, and it was great. And we talked about, what do you think we talked about? Uh, space sex? Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. She said that if she ever went into space, and I said, you know, do you want to have, like, sex in zero G? She said, yeah, like, why not? And I said, okay, we can send you there. And she said, oh, plus, if you get permission from your wife, I'll take you with me. <laughs> so <it> was... <laughs> oh, my God, you were propositioned by Dr. I was, Ruth. I was so propositioned by Dr. Ruth. Can I tell you, I think that sleeping with Dr. Ruth is not even, like, cheating. Like, no one could get upset about that. They'd be like, well, of course you have to sleep with her. It's Dr. Ruth. I mean, she's 84. Like, she's... Right. I mean, you might learn a few things, You right? might right? learn, especially from her. What have two people ever done with sex that she doesn't know about, right? So she's got the... Listen, all I'm saying is you both study black holes. Um, <laughs> I, uh, another interesting... I don't know how to back out of that. That was too... That was one step too filthy. Mm. But Alan Rickman was on. Alan Rickman. You, I assume you did not talk about uh, space sex with Alan Rickman. How, how did you? Do you know Alan? I, you know, I got people who know people, and I know people, so we got people. What? You don't have people? I have some people, but I don't have Alan Rickman people. Uh, and I got Alan. I, I got people. What did you guys? What did you guys talk about? Well, so yeah, I mean, he's an actor, right? Yeah. And he's he has some interesting science fiction roles. Sure. You know, he was in, in Galaxy Quest. One of the best. Wasn't that a crazy movie? And the fact like, that it's a comedy and still one of the best sci-fi movies of all time. Right, right, right. So he's in there, and I got his sort of reaction to that. Got him to chat a little bit about the magic of Harry Potter. He hadn't heard the, the Arthur C. Clarke edict about magic. Recite it, please. I, I don't know yes, it. Yes, you do know it. I don't know the Arthur I will take away your credentials. Oh, man. Man. Arthur C. Clarke. On magic, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. from magic. Yes, okay, I do know that. I do know that. I'm, Should I'm, I believe him? I'm yeah. sorry. I did. I did know that actually. Okay, I, I did know that. Which I always is always an interesting point to me when you when you. When... Did anyone get crushed by the wall? <laughs> did anyone die? All right, okay. good. We're still rolling, right? Yeah, we're okay. Still rolling. Let's just do a pickup. Keep going. I. Uh, that anyone? was magic. <laughs> we were just talking about magic, yeah. um, but w when you when you start getting into the idea of um, you know mythology and religion and science, and then go well, how do you explain this? It's like, well, maybe we just haven't figured out how to explain it yet. Well, so of course it looks like magic now. Exactly. People always need and want the ready-made explanation. I think most people are uncomfortable with ignorance or uncertainty, whereas you cannot be a research scientist unless you, in fact, embrace it. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, you learn to love the questions themselves. Because not all not all answers 
are in arm's reach. So do you feel like you... Either now or perhaps ever. So do you feel like you don't know anything still? I am impressed with what I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a good way to put it. that's what keeps me going every day. I loved your quote about, um, which I'm sure I believe I saw on Reddit, uh, about stupid... You read it on Reddit. Read it on Reddit, about stupid design, about embracing stupid, uh, like... Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm in a few places commenting on it. But what I said was that uh, science is a philosophy of discovery, and in, in, intelligent design is a philosophy of ignorance. Mm -hmm. It takes something we don't understand, and then you start saying, well, there's the higher intelligence. You didn't really explain it. You didn't, you, you, what you're saying is, I don't understand it, so here's this ready-made explanation that I'm going to apply every time I don't understand something. Right. And so I gave evidence of cases where all the world is not intelligent. I mean, it's kind of really stupid, actually. Yeah. You know, like, my favorite example is, like, what's going on between our legs? You know? Yeah. You got this, like, sewage system mixed with an entertainment complex, you know? <laughs> it's like, like, no engineer would have designed that at all, okay? So uh, other things, you know, you got tsunamis and earthquakes and, 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 and hurricanes and tornadoes and, and Earth wants to kill us. Yeah. People say, oh, Earth is a haven for like, no, it's not. No. No. 70% of the places I drop you butt naked on Earth, you're dead 15 minutes later. We create environments for us to thrive in and we adjust the thermostat so it's within a three degree temperature and we say, oh, isn't Earth perfect for us? <laughs> no. <laughs> No. It took 10,000 years to get to that. I so, yeah. <laughs> to earn that thermostat. Yeah. And so, so no, Earth is not a... Is, no, the, the universe is messed up. And they talk about the order of the cosmos. Yeah, tell that to the dinosaurs as they watch the, the asteroid hit them. Yeah, the order of their death. Yeah. They and 70% of all the species of life on Earth at that time went extinct. Well, um, I, I just, uh, I, I love the idea. I, I, I don't, I've always said that the human body is a bad design. That it's, uh, that it, it's like, and I, this is a gross example, but I use like, the fact that we have to wipe our asses is a bad design. <laughs> like, that's a bad, that's inefficient. I, I have a worse design. Yeah. Okay. I don't mind wiping my ass. Okay. What I mind is I breathe, eat, and drink mm -hmm. through the same hole in my body. <laughs> guaranteeing, because this is a species property, guaranteeing that some percent of humans will choke to death every single year. Right. Now, that's an easy problem to solve. Dolphins eat and breathe through two different holes in their body. Mm -hmm. No dolphin ever choked on a ham sandwich trying to breathe. No. And at an, at an all-you-can-eat salad bar, like a dolphin, <laughs> you can't compete with them. Because people have They're to stop to breathe. Constantly. They're just breathing and eating at the same time. There it is. Never take one to, like, a sizzler. Uh, it, you will, you'll go broke. That's, so that's, I think that, so that put, it, we could die. Mm -hmm. So some other things. So, for example, we live 80 years, but in eight weeks... Of no food, you're dead. Mm -hmm. In eight days of no water, you're dead. Eight minutes of no air, you're dead. Yet we live 80 years. <laughs> Yet all these things can kill us in just in these short periods of time. So we set up the system so that we don't die. Right. Just think about that. The whole system is so that we don't die. Yeah, so that true. we can try to live out at least most of these 80 years. Yeah. I'm just saying. To try to learn as much as we can in that amount of time. To tell the next people, like, oh, here's a bunch of shit we figured out. Good so, luck. So that you, and, and here's what we figured out so you don't die. Right. Right. Here's how you guys cannot die. Right, exactly. We'll try to invent these pills so you cannot die some more. Exactly. Now, talk about dying. Can I tell you, give you a spooky thought? Yes. Go back to 1900 and ask every, take a poll. Okay. Hey, everyone. Here we are back in 1900. Sure looks great. What are you most afraid of dying from? Uh, and people gave a list. It was like famine... Uh, tuberculosis, uh, what else? Jack the Ripper. The, yeah, I mean, so that list did not include killer asteroids. No. It didn't include viruses. It didn't include so many things today we would list that we fear, our li we fear for our lives. And so that leaves you wondering, in the year 2100, what would that list look like? Oh, God. What could be the causes of death in that century 
that we have yet to even dream of. And they'll look back and say, oh, how quaint. They were afraid of asteroids. We just have our little defense system here. That's not even a problem. What they don't know about is this. Right. So I stay awake at night wondering what could kill me that I've yet to dream of. Oh, that's so mind bendy. And, and horrif- that's mind bendy and horrifying at the same time. That's the best kind of mind bend. The kind that keeps <laughs> I stay awake at night. And I want everyone else to stay awake at night, too, <laughs> trying to resolve this. Th- these are the unknown unknowns. How important, because uh, uh, obviously the, the episode of the TV show that I'm going to put this in is, is all, all about science. Um, science rocks. Science rocks. Uh, I think anyone who listens to the show or watches the show would, would tend to agree with you. To be scientifically literate is to empower yourself to know when someone else is full of shit. Right. Can I say that? Yeah, yeah, you can swear. <laughs> swear a lot. It's fine. It when someone else is full of doo-doo. Yeah. You, you, you have an understanding of the properties of the laws of physics, so someone comes up to you and tries to sell you crystals, and they say, well, rub these together and you'll be healed. And you say, well, what are they made of? And how many people have they healed? And what ailments do they heal? And what is the mechanism? And how much do they cost? And where are they from? And what is the molecular structure? The person runs away in tears. Because the science literacy is not knowing the answer. You might know the answer, but that's not what's fundamental. What's fundamental is the capacity to inquire about what is true and what is not in this world. Mm-hmm. And that is the empowerment, the power of inquiry. Do you, feel like we, do you feel like we have to fully understand something to believe it? No. Dark matter, for example, mm-hmm. we don't understand that worth a damn. But we measure it. We measure the effect. If you can measure it, it's a contender. Okay. It's something you must reckon. And there's a famous quote by Logan Clendenning who said, no science achieves maturity without first developing a system of measurement. Oh, yes. And think about that. Look at how immature, for example, the field of psychology is, mm-hmm. especially clinical psychology. There's no system of measurement. Yeah, how are you going to measure someone's depression? Maybe, oh, is it 0 to 10? I mean, they just never had the systems of measurement. And so now we have whole hospitals filled with mental patients. So with physics has the benefit of many centuries of thinkers that have preceded modern day. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I can tell you within a second what time the sun is going to rise tomorrow, when you're going to have an eclipse, and when, you, when the, 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 the moon changes phases, and, and even the trajectory of that asteroid that could have our name on it. I have the power to do that. And so science is the, the, the most, the ones that have progressed the farthest are those that early established ways of measuring phenomena that they care about. What was it that you told me earlier about the eclipse? You said it's, it's actually a misnomer. Oh, it's a geeky, it's a geeky thing. I yeah. have to, but it's, it's stupidly, it's, it's... It's a fun geeky thing, oh, though. Okay. So it, 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 it crosses the fun threshold. This is geek. the fun threshold. Okay, okay. Because I, I, said, I said, oh, look... You just eclipsed, you know, I, I, I made some comparison to you eclipsing someone, and you said, well, technically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So an eclipse is a, one object passing into the shadow of another object. Okay. That's an eclipse. So a lunar eclipse is the moon moving into Earth's shadow in space. Mm-hmm. We cast a huge conical shadow, and it's always there. You don't know it's there until something lit up goes into it, mm-hmm. and then it disappears. So that's an eclipse. Whereas when the moon comes around to this side and passes between us and the sun, the sun is not being blocked by a shadow. The sun is being blocked by an object. Mm -hmm. And that's called an occultation, officially. An occultation. Occultation. So a solar eclipse is not really an eclipse. It's an occultation. So, by Occultation is one object goes in front of the other. Just, it's a technicality, and, but I don't fault anybody. I'm not, it's not like, like Jim Cameron when I got on his case about the wrong sky. Right. It's not that bad. Uh, 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 we use it. It's a solar eclipse. It's traditional. I won't fault you for it. So the song should have been Total Occultation of the Heart. <laughs> yes, exactly. Technically. Yeah, think about it. Nothing a total blockage. Total Occultation of the Like, it really doesn't fit the meter that <laughs> they, well, though. They, I think Occultation has a kind of rhythm to it. So had, had they started with the word occultation, <laughs> a different rhyme would have come out. Uh, <laughs> what was the Lionel Richie song you guys were trying to figure out? I don't know. Way? No, I won't even admit that we were trying to sing I brought Lionel Richie an hour ago. I think it was All Night Long. Was that the one was no, like... No, no, no. It was... Uh, 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 what was it? The Hello? Oh, it's hello. Me. Is it, that how it is goes? It, yeah. Is it me you're, you're looking, looking for? for? 
I can see it in your ass. Yeah, it's the one with the with the blind girl who makes the oh, yeah, that was so, sculpture. That was, oh my gosh, yeah, out of was, his Adelina Rich's one face. Of, one of the the forgettable videos. <laughs> but he, they love each other so much. They love each other so much. Is it me you're looking for? <laughs> Kind of messed up to say, is it me you're looking for to a blind lady? Well, the whole, this is what I'm saying. I don't know who thought up that premise. Not cool, Lionel Richie. You look at that and you say, now I know why they don't play videos anymore. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> these are the examples of why they don't. Well, people stopped watching videos. Like, that, you know, like there was a period in the, in the early to mid-80s where it was like, music videos. You had to. You and had then there to. was a harsh decline, and that's why MTV started putting on television, like programming shows. Because people just got over music videos pretty quickly, and yeah. they just didn't watch them that much anymore. Wait, but you have the rest of all your channels to watch shows, so I'm still surprised. Mm. No, the music video shows were the lowest rated shows on television at the time. And that's why they started doing game shows and programming and, and all contests and stuff was because people just, people actually stopped watching music videos in the, in the mid-80s. It's weird that some switch got turned to make that happen. I guess it was, I guess when you first see that like a place where music videos are aggregated, you go, what an amazing idea. And then after a while you're like, these are the same... <laughs> Ten, how many times can I be surprised? You know what music videos did? It completely changed the natural edit length mm -hmm. of what you're accustomed to seeing. If you look at videos, if you look at 1980 video, yeah. there are long two-minute cuts in that video. One minute, now it's three seconds at yeah. most. Seconds. Well, our attention spans, do you think we could ever go back? Or do you think attention spans are just ruined forever? I think it's ruined forever. I think it is. Now you can't look at something. Because we're visually stimulated. That's what feeds us. And so, what do you do? Do you ever stare at the same thing for a minute? No, you're looking around like this. So I, I think it is, it is a property of the fact that you get, all, you get a lot of information quickly in one glance. And then I'm done. Let me get another glance. Yeah. And so the video version of that is have a cut, the three-second cut. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and How then, long do you have to look at Paula Abdul's butt? Okay? You get three-second view. You go on to the next shot. Yeah. Or, or Madonna. I mean, it's there. I, actually, for me, it's 76 seconds. Oh, you I that. Yeah, 76 <laughs> seconds. Um, <laughs> in, in, as, in as much as you, as you kind of have... Did you actually use that word? But in as much is that not a, is that is that you know I, I in so far as I, yeah <laughs> I tweeted recently about words that just have too many words in them in as much in, nevertheless nevertheless in as much yeah yeah uh, there's a bunch of words like this and what concerns me is the poor word a lot people say that's two words damn it <laughs> no come on it's uh, don't tell me nevertheless is one word but I can't glue together a uh, and lot sorry that's lot. the way it is yeah I don't I don't buy that. So yeah. I'm going to start a lot movement. Insofar as nevertheless as much, <laughs> I guess uh, that you... you Heretofore. <laughs> we have... <laughs> Heretofore with her as well to... The... A lot! Don't you feel sympathy for her? Oh, it's the Pluto of, uh, of, of, of word <laughs> the combos. <unloved> yeah. <laughs> well, it's a, we'll call it a dwarf <laughs> phrase. Dwarf. <laughs> it's a multi-word wannabe. It yeah, is. Okay. Uh, but I interrupted. I'm sorry. You must you be at saying. least this tall to ride this word ride. Um, I guess it's just the idea that 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 you uh, you have this quest to promote science, and there and that that it is a difficult, it's surprisingly difficult quest in 2012. Whereas uh, you know we always had this vision of the future as like, oh, people will be more enlightened and people will be more this, and we'll all understand science a lot better. And and I feel like. A lot of people just willfully reject it anyway. We're, I think even worse now than even like 20 years ago. You know what we have to do? We have to compel people to be embarrassed for not knowing about science. Yeah. And I think that's the only way to do it. Then they'll come to it on their own. Yeah. Otherwise, you're beating them over the head. And, you know, that's no fun for either side. No, but you have, but so you, you have, you know, like you have, you have people who haven't learned science yet. You have science deniers. And then also this like weird pseudoscience movement as well of people that frame... Non nonsense in ways that sound scientific, right. but actually it's a facade for an empty house. I'm thinking of the 60s when we're going to the moon. It was hard for someone to rise up with the strong pseudoscience posture back then because science, technology, and engineering was delivering to you in the pages of the daily papers the fruits and benefits of being scientifically literate. Mm -hmm. You had no place to stand back then. Yeah. It was writ large on the headlines. 
And now, what, what headline, are there any science headlines? Well, I guess there are. You know, the, the particle accelerator in Europe, but it's not here, right? Right. right? So uh, is there anything else? No, it's bad economy headlines every day. So I say, let's go to Mars. Or go to ask, stop that asteroid headed our way. Or let's go hang out on the moon. That, that mining story about asteroids... That, that took some headlines. That, got that some was headlines. a very interesting, the idea of the idea of basically of, of shifting to a culture of space miners where yes. we locate all of these asteroids. Here we are killing each other because your, 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 your left butt cheek is over a, a reservoir of oil yeah. or, a, or, or some kind of That oil did metal. not come from my body, by the way. That was there when I sat down. I just want to be clear about that. <laughs> the iron drop, the, the, the iron deposit. Was yeah, it was, it was already there. <laughs> so you get this, and what are we doing here? I'd be embarrassed if an alien landed. They say, hey, how, where are you getting your resources? Well, we're killing each other over this line in the sand because we dig it out of the earth. Yeah. Well, how are you getting your energy? We're digging that out of the earth, too. <laughs> I'd be embarrassed. I say, alien, you know, give us another hundred years. Maybe we'll figure this one out. <laughs> Don't you get it from the sun? How about the minerals and the asteroids? How about the, you know, asteroids? You know why you get minerals and asteroids? Asteroids are fragments of planets that never stayed whole. They want to become a planet in the early solar system. They're molten. They're gaseous first and then perhaps molten. When you're molten, heavy things fall to the middle. Light things float. Then you freeze. You freeze it out. Okay. Freeze meaning it solidifies. Sure. So now... It, it already did the filtering for you. It already did the sifting. So now another body comes in, smashes it, and I have chunks of asteroid that are hewn from the core of a planet that never made it. And it's got all the heaviest ingredients there. You've got your iron, which we got here in plenty of But all the rest of the heavy elements are concentrated there. Iridium, platinum, gold, osmium, uh, tungsten. All these precious metals that we use in industry and in the military, it's all there. They're chunks of rocks sitting out there waiting to be kissed. That are flying by the earth. Flying by the earth. And we're still, excuse me, I've got to pull this out of the ground. I can't, I can't begin to tell you how primitive that activity is. How far off do you think we are from, from space mining? A zillion years. No. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> no, no. I, you know, I, 50 years maybe. Okay. Yeah. I was in the airport the other day and... Uh, there was a guy, the guy in front of me in the security line. It was the weirdest thing I've ever heard at a security line where everyone's taking all their laptops out and then, and he puts a bunch of stuff into the, into the bin and then he says to the TSA, TSA officer, I just want to let you guys know I have a lot of tungsten here. And I could, I, and it was weird, A, that he pointed it out, B, that he thought that they would think anything of it, and C, why does someone carry a lot of tungsten around? <laughs> what is the purpose of, of carrying tungsten around? Well, tungsten has a very high melting point. So uh, that's why it's the filament of choice in light bulbs. Okay. Yeah. But why would this guy have a bunch of tungsten just I'm, I'm not loose? authorized to say. Oh, all right. Oh, oh. <laughs> Dead. Tungsten's cool. No, I, I once carried a meteorite through... Security and I thought should I declare it in advance and I did this coincidentally on the anniversary of September 11th 2002 in Dulles Airport outside of Washington. I have a meteorite. I have a 15 pound meteorite. It's in a box and I thought do I call in advance and prepare then I thought that would call too much attention to it and Then they get spooked so I said I'll just go up there with the meteorite I mean it probably just looks like a rock that you bought at a, at a museum, you know like at a store, right? No, no, this is a metallic meteorite which would be opaque to x-rays Oh. This is a blob thing that they cannot see through going through the air. So I just put it there, walk through, and I said, uh, excuse me, what's in this box? I said, oh, it's just a meteorite. <laughs> <laughs> I said, it was as cool as could be. And then one person uh, recognized me. He said, hey, oh, you're the guy from the museum with the space? And I said, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. And they all crowded around and looked at the meteorite, and they touched it. And so it was a, little, it was a scene. But I, I got it through. When they all touch it, you go, uh, you're all mutants now. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, all, I didn't say, you shouldn't, you're not supposed to touch that. <laughs> Is there any fear of, of, of space mining and bringing, uh, bringing any kind of uh, particle, yeah, anything back to Earth that shouldn't be here? The Andromeda strain. Right, exactly, the Andromeda strain. I'm not authorized to. Damn it! <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> they could be. I mean, they did this with the Apollo astronauts. They came back from the moon. They quarantined them. And they studied to see if there were any moon bugs that came with them. And th that was kind of cool. But I kept thinking, wait a minute. The capsule that came from the moon splashed down in our ocean. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> then you fish them out of the water. Now you put them in a quarantine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a little late, I think. You yeah. Know? But uh, they found no bugs, nothing, you know, no known life. The moon, we would expect it to have, like, thriving organics. Right. Uh, so, so our expectations were fulfilled. You know. It'd be pretty amazing to, I was, I was also, I, this website io9 uh, just recently had an article about how... Stuff about me shows up there every now and then. Sam, maybe you pop up there a little no, bit Every now and then it shows a hey. Yeah. yeah. You're, very, you're very popular. I don't know if you know this or not, but you're no, very popular. I don't popular. think about it. I just try to do my thing. Yeah. I, um, but io9 had a story about, yes, Star Trek did inspire a lot of things that became a reality in terms of communicators and, and whatnot and inspired a generation of people, but most of, the, most of it was wrong. And the first, the first example was spaceships. We don't have, we are not a spaceship culture. There's no, we don't, it's in, it, there's, Example number one. There's no spaceship. way to travel from point A to distant point B. Um, you know, just the, the logistics that would be involved. So, that, so you know, th there are now these theories like, no, if we, if we travel, if there is interstellar travel, it's basically like we're going to have to upload our personalities onto a cube yeah, and, and send it. The fastest piece of hardware we've ever sent is in motion now to Pluto. Yeah. It, the first rule of scientific experiments are you get your results before you die. Okay, so <laughs> Pluto is very far away. I have my colleagues that are working on Pluto. Yeah. It's their whole suite of launch vehicles where it would get there in 2030, 2040. They said, no, we, give me your biggest engines. But now you have to make the payload small. So the big engines propel something small. So it was small craft, big engines. It, it passed the moon in like six hours. I mean, the thing was oh booking. My oh my gosh. It was hauling. And so it'll get to Pluto in uh, three years now. So, three years? Well, well, three years from now. Yeah, it was launched uh, about five years ago. Yeah. What are some of the best images that we have of Pluto so far? The Hubble telescope was getting the best ones. But as this thing gets closer, it'll get better and better and better. So, but it's still this, uh, it has very a big contrast between light and dark. So there's still, it's still a mystery. I mean, is it? And just so you know, I'm on you. I'm, on, I'm, 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 I'm ahead of you. Don't at the end of it say, so does that mean Pluto should still be a planet? <laughs> no, I wouldn't okay. dare. We covered this the last time That's you were on. That's what I'm saying. We covered this the last time you were on. But is, is there anything, you know, a, as we get better, higher resolution images of, of you know, planets in our solar system or even, or even data from distant stars, I mean, are we still discovering shocking things about these bodies or is it sort of confirming or within the neighborhood of things we thought we We have some expectations. Uh, let me tell you the biggest shocker of, of them all. We go look for planets that don't orbit our sun, mm -hmm. exoplanets. Yep. And we say, okay, we have our solar system. We must be representative of all solar systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not? It's actually called the Copernican principle. All right. Noting that you're not special. Okay? <laughs> That's the... <laughs> what a great way to tell someone <laughs> their kid's not special. Uh, he's the Copernican it's principle. It's the Copernican principle, yeah. yes. Oh, yes. that sounds fancy. Yeah, yes, you, you're, chances are you're average, all right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's true. The Earth is not the biggest or the smallest planet. The sun is not the hottest, it's not the coldest, it's not the biggest, it's not the smallest. We're the porridge gold. We're, we're in a in a suburban arm in the galaxy, in an ordinary galaxy. Yeah. It was, it was nothing special. Okay? So we go to look for other solar systems, other star systems, and what we find are big Jupiters orbiting really close to the host star. We had come up with theories of the formation of star systems that would sort of look like ours. Sure. If we are at some metric of what is mm -hmm. in the cosmos. And so the planets were in all places that we could not understand. We had to invent a whole new theory of, 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 star, for, of star formation and star system formation to account for that. Is that exciting to a group of scientists when they go, holy crap, we get to come up with this whole new... Yes! We are seduced by ignorance. Because therein are the places where new ideas can thrive. Mm-hmm. We're called to it. And is that what we need to be instilling into people, is the idea of discovering new ideas instead of clinging to old, No, because ones? new ideas are rare. You have to have them embrace the quest. Okay. Because that quest doesn't always land on a new idea, but the quest will always be interesting. Because you learn things, you learn ways to not do things. Sure. That's the famous quote from Thomas Edison. I, I, I'll... I'll mess it up if I try to get it exactly, but it was something like, you know, he tried all these different materials to figure out what he should use 
for the filament of his Edison light bulb. Finally lands on tungsten. Can I take a guess to make up for the Arthur C. Clarke one? It was something to the effect of, I didn't fail 99 times. I learned 99 ways to not make a light bulb. Was it something like that? It was. Uh, we'll give you B plus. Okay, that. good, good, good. <laughs> at least I proved that I was I was in the neighborhood. You're in, you're in the in the hood. Okay, it, what was the in the geek hood? What was the actual quote? No, no, it was, it was close to that. It was, it was whatever was the number. Yeah. They said, "Don't you feel bad about all this time you wasted just to find tungsten?" And he says, "No, I didn't waste the time. I, just, I found you know 99 ways to not. You know, I find 99 objects that do. But a bitch ain't one." <laughs> <laughs> Nobody? Really? Just, I'm the only J. Z. Sorry. 99 elements that will not work in a light bulb. So that's, so that's the slow way to get to the result. Usually you need sort of a theory of understanding sure. so that you can be pre selective. Yeah. You don't want to just randomly go through the lab. I mean, I, 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 love, I love the idea of Edison too, and I, I just because. I think some people have a sense of like he wasn't just one guy working by himself, and it, like he had a team of yeah, people, a huge that were constantly huge, huge, yeah. almost like an artist colony of scientists. Yes, yes, exactly. And they were under his guidance, and he had yeah. certain ideas, and he had the funding, and he paid their salaries. So, but yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe Steve Jobs today was like that. I always, I, I yeah. tried to make that comparison to Steve Jobs to Edison, and someone's like. You're full of shit. And I'm like, no, 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 no. He didn't, he didn't design the iPhone. He hired the right people to carry out his vision. Correct. Correct. He had a vision, and he put so the architects in So why are they saying they don't like your analogy? I don't know. They just, I don't know, because some people... So slap them. I would on to the next person. Neil, if I took the time <laughs> to slap <laughs> everyone online that I wanted to slap, I would be in the slapping business, and I would have to give up everything else that I do, because there's no shortage of people you want to slap online. And I don't even know how someone in your position who probably gets, you know, as much as you have supporters, you also probably have violent detractors who who want to tell you how wrong and an awful of a person you are when you just say something very simply that you have discovered and I don't know how here's how do how, you emotionally here's how I get, here's how I get around that I hardly ever express an opinion oh oh that's oh that's good no think about that and so I'll give you an example a perfect example I am quoted as saying God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. Okay? Mm -hmm. Dude, somebody put that on a t-shirt. Signed, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. Now, that sounds audacious, right? Just getting out there in the ring. But that's, that's incomplete. That's not actually the full thing that I said. I said, if God is the frontier of what we yet understand in the universe mm -hmm. to you, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. Oh, okay. Okay? There is not an opinion in that sentence. That is an if-then statement. A conditional clause. A conditional clause. And so, given that, what's important there is, I'm, uh, there are people who say, well, what, they asked me what was before the universe. I, I, I don't know. That was God. They say, well, what is dark matter? I say, I don't know. Well, that's the spirit of God. Yeah. So they're jumping into the sort of the God of the gaps yeah. mode. And I say, if that's what God is to you, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. And so if you take only half that quote, it looks like I'm handing you my opinion. Right. But in fact, with the if-then clause, it is true no matter what. And it, what it does is you cannot then argue with me because that, that's not a... That's not a me statement. It's a, it's, it's a logically constructed sentence. And you might have issues with the sentence, but you can't have issues with me. That's the point here. Yeah. So I hardly ever express opinions. That's really interesting. I'll I, give you another, another one. Another one. You know, I have a book that just came out recently about space exploration. Uh -huh. And people say, oh, I'm on a hobby horse trying to get people interested in space. No. I'm trying to get you to understand why, if you're not interested in space, it will undermine the stability of your economy. And then I present that argument. So at the end of the day, you take ownership of your understanding of the causes and effects of things, and it doesn't even require reference back to me. Because it is an enlightened position that you now have that you didn't have before. Interesting. So that's why I'm, uh, people, I don't get attacked. I really don't. Good. 
It sounds like you get attacked all the time. Constantly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get attacked because as an educator, it's not about me. It's never about me. It's about the knowledge and wisdom of the natural world and how your, your knowledge and wisdom of that can empower you to make decisions that you take ownership of. So I'm duty bound as a scientist and as an educator to share this information with you. What you do with it after that in a free society, that's your business. I don't lobby Congress, I don't lead marches, I don't give speeches at rallies, because that implies you want people to do what you do and to say what you say. I never care about that. All I want people to do is be enlightened. And then they vote for whoever the hell they want. Yeah. And in a free society, you have the right to do that. I don't talk to members, I get invited in, but I don't, I don't seek to influence members of Congress because they're duly elected from some base of, of voters. Why should I do an end run on the wishes of those voters? And then, the, so suppose I even influence that member of Congress. Then two years later, they voted out someone else comes. I gotta go back and influence another one? Isn't it more efficient to enlighten the electorate in the first place? Because they're there every two years. Let's, and so for me, the goal is a smarter country. For me, the goal is people who can think for themselves. How do we achieve that? <laughs> I guess if we knew that, it wouldn't be a problem. Right. Well, you, you, you think for yourself not by telling them what to think, but by training them how to think. Sure. Yeah, well, we, don't, we certainly don't... Um, I mean, if you look at the education system, a lot of it doesn't really train kids how to think necessarily. It's like here's... Not at all. It's like here's the lesson plan, learn it, you test it on it. There it is. Yeah, I mean, I know that um, when I was younger, uh, and I'd be in, like, English class or whatever, and they'd say, well, like, for instance, conditional, well, this is a conditional clause. And i go, okay, I guess that's a conditional clause. And it wasn't until I went to high school and studied Latin that I went back, and, I, and then I really understood, oh, this is why these things are the way they are, and that's what that means, and that's... Now you take oh, ownership I, of the knowledge. Yeah, exactly, and, it's, it's, and you kind of feel like, oh, I get it now, rather than just, I'm regurgitating a bunch of shit right. I heard. Right, right, that's the difference between... That's the diff people think you go to school so that they can fill your mind, but it really, a proper training turns an empty mind into an open mind. But as much as people are addicted to comfort, and I think holding on to old ideas, I think there's, there's such a addicted chemical... Addicted to comfort, I like that. They are addicted to comfort. Do you hear, do you hear the, the contrast between the British and the French? Have you ever heard that one? No. It's the British spend money on comforts, but that same money when spent by the French is spent on pleasures. <laughs> and if you look at the two cultures, there it is. Yeah. You know... The, Brit the, the, the British, he's got the cigar and the sherry and the comfort comfortable chair. In France, they have the wine, the food, the, you know, yep. the debauchery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so how you spend your time. Yeah. But also, there's such, a, there's such a chemical reward for learning things and understanding things. And it's like, how do we, you know, I almost feel like you have to trick people en masse with their own physiology of like, here, see, this actually feels I like good. the chemical award, re reward concept, because that's how you felt. Whatever chemistry coursed in your body and your mind when you took Latin and f figured out what that other thing meant, mm -hmm. something changed in you. It felt good, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, of course. No, it didn't just feel good. It felt good. It felt really good. Good, good. good. So, so that's, that's the aha moment, and I think we all have that capacity and that power. And so as the educator, I try to seek to instill an aha moment in whoever will, will listen. <laughs> but sometimes you can create something that they are drawn to, and then you don't have to beat them over the head. That's the kind of electorate I want. And that'll, that electorate will ensure that tomorrow is a more advanced state of the nation than today. Yeah. It will become their prime directive. Well, you know, when some states <laughs> are talking about, you know, teaching, like... Uh, like intelligent design, or is it? Well, well, education is local. Education is a local thing. Education is not stipulated in the in the Constitution, and whatever is not stipulated there is under control of the states. So states control education. Ta the government cannot tell you what to teach in your schools. They can advise it, but they can't tell you. They can't force it, and they don't. So, 
So yeah, some school districts will teach whatever they want. And if they don't teach what you want, people take the kids out of school and homeschool them. Mm -hmm. The largest growing sector of homeschoolers are, is the religious community that doesn't want their kids to learn about evolution. That's the largest growing sector of homeschooling. So, so yeah, you can go in there and try to argue it and scream. I'm just saying, let's just offer what being scientifically literate can do for you and let people recognize that on their own. I think that's the, that's the kinder, gentler solution. But I think in the end, it's the only solution that will actually work. Because a person has to be self-motivated to want to know it, to want to learn it, and to want to be it. Yeah, so maybe, maybe rather than teaching knowledge, we need to be teaching people how to be self-motivated. Well, yeah, or that's the insight, in part insight, uh, or light a flame where they want to go learn more about that subject. Oh, yeah. I know that uh, I, I just saw an announcement today that Harvard and MIT released a bunch of, they're releasing uh, free courses online where you can actually get... Uh, you you can actually get a Harvard or MIT education through online courses. Yeah, I mean, and then you'll find out it's the same damn course you could have gotten at the, at the local. <laughs> no, Physics 101 in Harvard is Physics 101 in, you know, Oshkosh Community College. Right. I mean, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole, uh, you know, most of what you do learn in college are, are standard textbooks. So, you know, I think there's... Uh, elite schools are overrated in what you can actually end up learning when you just have access to the same textbooks that they have. Right. Yeah, I guess that really was the big dividing line in the old days. Of like, you literally had to have the physical knowledge in, in books in place. And now it's like, well, boy, I could learn about thermal dynamics by looking at my phone. Exactly. Like, like, exactly. That's the great scene in Goodwill Hunting. Oh, where he say, oh, where he, he 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 totally slaps that kid down at the bar with he bitch slaps him. <laughs> <laughs> it was like yes. Yeah, I'm just a uh, you know I'm just a janitor who happens to be super smart. smart. Yeah, I was, I'm super smart. So what? You uh, you spent uh, you know hundred thousand dollars. Uh, dollars. Uh, you could have gotten a library card and late charges. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. P.S. I hope that I'm also a math genius and you're not a math genius, but uh, but but you could have you know. Otherwise, it's fine. I just met Bill Nye the other night. He's my guy. He's awesome. He's, he's my boy. Oh my God, he's so awesome. All right. In fact, he's coming to town this weekend. I'm going to be chilling with him. Having I dinner with him. I love Bill Nye. He came to a we had a Nerdist Channel launch party and Bill Nye. And I came, and uh, there were other celebrity types there. And Bill Nye was the guy that that got the moat. Like, I, I'm surprised that people didn't rip him apart, <laughs> like just trying to touch him and take pictures. And it was it was really it made me feel like we're doing the right thing when we have a party to represent the things that we're doing and working and caring about. And Bill Nye is the guy that gets the most attention. There it is. That 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 was a nice that was a nice he thing. He walks for down me. the street, there are like legions of people following him. They just start right? following yeah. him, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's cool. Are you guys working together on, on uh, stuff? We we collaborate. He's he's uh, he's what, what is, uh, executive director of the Planetary Society. Yeah. The society founded by Carl Sagan 32 years ago. Yep. And I'm on the board, so I have many occasions to... We have a board meeting in Washington on Monday. Oh, that's so he's awesome. coming through town. We're going to hang out before then. Anything, anything fun things coming up at the Hayden Planetarium? Uh, well, actually, I'm on a kind of sabbatical now doing okay. these other projects. Uh, but the attendance is going gangbusters. New York City is almost like a tourist renaissance now. Good. I mean, the, the tourism is at an all-time high in New York, actually. International tourism as well. And they go to all the fun museums, and so we see them every time. Now there's like accents and languages that never used to be there when I was growing up as a kid. So the city's doing well, the museums are doing well, and... Uh, and my book came out just two, exactly two months ago on space exploration, and it's got to put some buzz out there just to get us back, back on a frontier that I think we long lost sight of. So it's well, been keeping me off the streets. Well, you're 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 a very powerful voice uh, in, in in not just science but also in in promoting science education, and I think it's very important. And I'm I'm can I tell you how excited I am when I tell people that we're doing Star Talk as a video show on the Nerdist channel, like. It was, I leaked it at a show that I was doing a live show, and I threw out a bunch of names, and people clapped, and then I said, and we're going to do Star Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it turned into, like, deaf comedy jam. Like, I'm not kidding. One guy jumped out of his, he was like, holy shit! Like, he, and people went bananas. So, it, I... Now I have to live up to that. You I really mean, do. It's a lot of pressure. But, uh, but, I'm, but I can't thank you enough for, for letting us uh, put, put Star Talk on the channel. I'm super excited about excellent. it. Excellent. Well, it's a place, I mean, and... and my hope is that not only nerds go there, right? I mean, you want to spread the love. Sure. 
And nerds already, we already know who we are. Sure, you know, sure, and who sure. we hang out with and sure. who to recite decimals of pi to. You know, so the, 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 real, the real impact will be others recognizing that this is a cool place to be in a cool state of mind and a cool outlook on life, the universe, and everything. Uh, well, to that I say... Three point one four one five nine two six five three five eight nine seven nine three two three eight four six two six four three three eight the two seven nine five zero two eight eight four one nine seven one six nine three nine nine three seven five one zero five eight two zero nine seven four nine four four five nine two three zero seven eight one six four zero six two eight six two zero eight nine nine eight six two eight zero three four eight two five three four two one one seven zero six seven nine eight two one four eight zero eight six five two. I think that's all I know. Seven. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, that, that's the equivalent of just dropping a scientific wiener on the table and being like, here you go. Uh, but uh, yes, I'm a big, big fan of pie, Excellent. Uh, if it wasn't uh, apparent. But uh, to you, I say, enjoy your burrito, which is what we say at the end of our podcasts. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. It's, you know what? It's exactly, it basically means enjoy the process. That's exactly what enjoy a burrito means. It means don't think about the future, don't think about the fat past, live in the moment and enjoy the process and enjoy enjoy the present. I'll do that. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me again. And you, you're on my set here. I know I'm on yes, your set here yes, on Star Talk. It's yes, great. Yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm just bummed that I don't live in New York so I can't come hang out at more of your tapings. That is, I'll, and I, I'll be hitting L.A. often, so I'm going to you know, uh, pop by uninvited. Please, 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 <laughs> please do as much as you want. You're doing Cosmos, right? Yes, yes, Cosmos. Oh, yeah, it's another project. We got time to talk about that. It's not coming out until 2014. Okay. So we got time. Okay, great. We'll We're talk scripting about it now, and it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to fill those shoes or to occupy the shoes held by Carl Sagan to yes. take Cosmos into the future, the 21st century reboot of that landmark television series. So 13 episodes, airing on Fox, by the way. Oh. People said, Fox. But they're like a bunch of science networks on Fox. That's the most common reaction sure. I get. And I say, well, that's why it belongs on Fox. <laughs> so, is that where, isn't that how you, this works? You know? You know, but there is an interesting thing to say for you, where you kind of like, when you're preaching to your crowd, it's great. But that, that's, a, that's a bolder stance of like, no, 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 preach outside the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Because that's where you're going to really pull people in. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right, cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so, again. Good thanks, to see you. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks. Mm -hmm.